Welcome to the Bad Beat Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Eisenstadt, and today we got my good buddy, Ryan Bates, on the show. He is a Navy SEAL. Uh, he owns Canoe Club USA, and he's just an all-around badass, and he actually, you know, might be related to me one day. His uh, his his son and my daughter are in some kind of puppy love going on. <laughs> yeah, he thinks she's the most beautiful girl in the world, man, yeah, so dude. stand by. It's so awesome, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, went, uh, we went bowling the other night, and dude, you got... Freaking, you got us hooked on them on those coin machine games. We crushed it, right? Though, dude, we did crush it. Yeah, we were walking, and you know what? You know what's hilarious is my office manager was bowling when we went through, and she said she saw us walking with all the giant like balls walking through the uh, the bowling. Yeah, dude. We well, could spend a couple hundred bucks in a lot of places, and I always feel somewhat fulfilled when you get out of there. You know? Oh yeah, and the kids were having a blast, man. Yeah, they had a blast. Oh, I forgot to mention also Diana Dahlgren's husband. Uh, we, oh. we, we had to, we had to put that on there, right? Yeah. Yeah. She, she'll like that. <laughs> um, okay. So complete badass Navy seal, uh, canoe club USA. Let's, uh, let's, let's reverse engineer this. What is canoe club USA? Uh, canoe club USA. I got into, uh, ammo about, uh, two years ago when the ammo shortage, the ammo shortage happened and a lot of people couldn't get, it, I could get it. So, um, I started a company and pretty much crushed it through all of COVID. Yeah. And then now it's. Pretty much self-running, and we have a good customer base, and we just, if you guys need ammo, I've got shitloads of it. Always. Yeah, man. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, where'd you come up with the name Canoe Club USA? Uh, it's uh, Canoe and a Head. You ever watch Tombstone? Uh-uh. No? No. Oh, I'd like canoe Headshot. Okay. Yeah, if you get smoked in the head, it's Canoe and a Head. I don't know if it's the <laughs> most politically correct uh, That's okay. <laughs> thing, but people love the logo and uh, love the hidden meaning behind it. So, so Canoeing a Head. I probably won't get in any government. Con- I probably won't get any government contracts with this thing. But <laughs> you know, <laughs> either way, the it's okay. The the, the, the uh, customers love it. You know, so yeah, it's awesome. I, I love the canoe riding through the school. <laughs> it's sick, dude. No, it's yeah, badass. No, it's funny. I don't. Uh, you know, we sell apparel, and you know, I just kind of do it for uh, you know advertising yeah. and stuff like that. But we actually sell so much freaking apparel with it that because everybody loves the the logo so much yeah dude sick how how did you get into ammo though so for, for the longest time i was um, protecting a pretty high net worth guy for about a decade and one of the guys on the detail with me <clears throat> broke off the detail and started doing ammo maybe 10 years ago and uh he's pretty successful and we always kept in contact and he said, hey, with your you and your wife's social media following, you guys should get into ammo. You can make way more money than on the detail. And I did. And it freaking, probably in the first month, maybe two or three months, actually, I made more money in probably a year and a half on the detail. So it was a good thing to get into. Damn. And him. And then also, it's weird. Um, the ammo world is kind of a like a good old boy circle. And uh, it's been ran probably by the same generation people for you know, two or three generations is a very tight knit group, you know, but because of my background and I'm pretty charismatic guy, um, got right to the top, figuring out who has the ammo, who doesn't and, um, negotiate with him. And pretty much we were, we were probably important at one point, like, um, three to four and a half millions a month or three to four and a half million rounds a month and blowing through them. So Holy it, was, shit. it was good It's slow down now, but <clears throat> you know, I own all my own space. Their the overhead's pretty low. And, um, you know, making back then I was probably making 300% of my money now 50%. It's good. Yeah. It's a good little business to get into. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. It's pretty easy too. I don't manufacture anything. I just buy it, tack on 50%, 15% and ship it out. It's gotta be fun too, right? Yeah. It's good. I always have ammo. Yeah. <laughs> There's a, there's ever a, a zombie apocalypse found, fall back to the Bates house, you know? Oh, dude, I'll tell you right now, if any shit goes down, I'm coming over. I hope <laughs> yeah, you know that. Yeah, 100%. I'm grabbing Ev, I'm grabbing Sierra, we're jumping <laughs> yeah. in the Razor, and we're fucking yeah. flying over, dude. 100%. Uh, so, how was it, uh, you did personal detail? <laughs> yeah, so, I was got it for one guy? Uh, one, one guy. People? One guy. So, I got out of SEAL Team 1 in 2011, January, um, and immediately I started uh, doing anti-piracy, running those piracy waters between... Egypt and South Africa and Sri Lanka and um, for about three years, like 28 deployments. And uh, I met Diana and uh, I knew I had to stick around a dater or <laughs> you can't really hold down a relationship if you're never around. So I jumped on and put my name out there. And there's a lot of people that like to hire out seals to do their protection, especially high, high net worth guys. Yeah. <clears throat> it was a good, it was a good uh, gig, man. And what, I mean, like, what was your, what was your day to day like? Like, did, did you experience any kind of crazy shit that no. you, 
had experienced when you were deployed or? No, you know what? Uh, high net worth people, they want to, they want the best to protect them. A lot of times they don't really have super high threat situations. Uh, the guy I was with did it first, but then that kind of slowed down. And then we were just so efficient and kind of doing security plus helping him do his life and that kind of stuff. He kept us on. Paid really well. Um, I only worked about six, seven months out of the year, two weeks on, two weeks off, and uh, it was good to go. We had one s- kind of sketchy situation where his wife almost got carjacked, but uh, it was off pretty quick, you know, so. Really? Yeah. You guys fuck yeah. him up? No, no, we just <laughs> showed our presence and they were out of there. Really? But, uh, but yeah, overall, it's, uh, I don't know, you end up kind of being almost like a life assistant when you do it, do that kind of stuff. It's not really, yeah. not just about security, but kind of everything. So, uh, and also to being around those high net worth people, it kind of bleeds off on all their experience. Um, the guy I protected, he's, he's very, very wealthy, very, um, uh, kind of a badass in business. And because you're so close with them, they end up kind of bleeding off their knowledge. And it's like going, I'm sure to like a master in business in a couple of years. If you, if you pay attention, you ask the right questions. And, and it was definitely an awesome thing because it helped progress mine and Diana's financial life outside of the actual uh, job. So it was good. So you learned a lot, dude. Learned a lot. Yeah. Learned a lot. It's crazy. I mean, they always say, you know, your, your net, your network is your net worth. Yeah. I, yeah. I freaking, I sat across like some of the, or met some of the Don Brand owns uh, Irvine group, like just big names that probably some of the wealthiest people in America and um, Mike Milken, just uh, geniuses. And, you know, you, and they allow you to ask the questions or you might be in a situation dinner and you kind of just, you know, as long as you're not a, a pussy and just kind of have confidence to talk to them, just ask them questions. And that's all I did. And I learned about real estate, learned about business and uh, it was awesome. That's so crazy. <clears throat> yeah. And they, they love, they love my family too. So Dinah used to get flown out to different events and they brought her in the circle too. So it helped her out too in business too. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Dude, and, and, and just like being around the, those high level of people, I mean. Oh, yeah. I learned I learned a lot what I like and what I don't like. You know, like sometimes the high net worth people, they're so about business that maybe not always their family life. Not the guy I was with, but maybe their family life's not the great or they've been through this kind of, they almost worship the dollar too much. So it's definitely, I never want to be a billionaire. <laughs> really? Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's too much. You know, and a lot of them are kind of more... I don't know, narcissistic or you ha- kind of have to be at that, that point, you know, and, um, I would, uh, I'd rather be wealthy for my family, but put more, more time in my family life. Yeah. It, it, <clears throat> it's probably super hard to find that balance. Yeah. Not with those, those people, they, to get to that level, you have to be gnarly. Really? Yeah. Unless it's kind of a, especially self-starters, maybe if it's a generational wealth where it's been passed down from the great grandpa down to that, but the guys that start as like, you know, hundred thousandaires or millionaires and then make it to billionaires. You know, it's, uh, it's those guys are, are gnarly. <clears throat> Dude, I think I just had an epiphany. What? I mean, I've been chasing money so much, you know what I mean? It's just like, yeah, you don't want to chase money too much. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I, I didn't grow up with much, right? And yep. I, I don't know what you grew up with. Kind of you, same, same. Okay. So, you know, I, I didn't grow up with much, so I've always had this vision in my head of, man, I need, I need to make so much money so I can give my, like Everly the life that I never had. Yeah. You know, the toys, the trips, the, the stuff. And, uh, you know, it really wasn't until, I don't know, last week that I yeah. was like, what kind of picture am I painting in my head that I think my family has on me? Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yep. Like, like I'm painting a picture in my head that, you know, Sierra and Everly, like, what do they see me as versus what they actually like? Who am I the man that I think they need versus who, like, who's the man that they actually need? Yeah. You know what I mean? They don't need this billionaire who can buy them whatever the fuck they want and is unable to spend quality time with them. And it really, it really did click with me the other day. And that's why, uh, what was it yesterday? I, shut like pretty much shut my phone off and took Everly on like a daddy daughter day. And we spent so much quality time, dude. And it was like, that's invaluable. hundred percent. You know what I mean? And, and th- that's the thing that she's going to hold on to forever. Well, if you don't say if you build wealth, right. But you don't put any attention into your kids. Right. Um, when you die, nobody will remember your name. <laughs> it's really what it comes down to, you know? So if uh, a lot of, a lot of kids that what I've seen 
they uh, almost kind of look at, look down at their dad because they're never around them during the times they need him the most. So making money to a point, but at the same time, you know, having that time with your kids so you bond. That way they come up loving you and maybe you have something to pass your wealth on too. Yeah. You know? Hundred percent. Sometimes it's just hard to to find that balance, man. And especially as like a, a man, you know what I mean. Like at least for me, I want to be the provider. I want to make sure that my family is taken care of financially, and then you know security, right? Like I want to be that alpha male in the home, and and you know let them know that they're safe at all times. Which you definitely don't got to fucking worry about. <laughs> <laughs> well, if yeah. you look at us too, like you know we started not the wealthiest people, you and me, and we're finding motivation in that too. So. You know, your dad doesn't always need to be the wealthiest guy, you know, to for you to move on and progress in life. Right. <clears throat> more more having time and uh, having bonding with your kids, I think, is huge. Was uh, What were you doing when you guys had your first son? Oh, I owned a couple bars and restaurants. Yeah. Really? We, yeah, we... Uh, Wait, here? No, in Spokane, Washington. We, I did uh, not know that. No, yeah, we... Um, I, had, I made a lot of money through uh, contract and doing that piracy stuff. We were getting paid thousand bucks a day plus, you know, and, uh, and racked up pretty good savings. And then I got the, the job with, um, <clears throat> the high net worth guy, but he, for those two weeks off, you know, I had a lot of time on my hands. So I, I went up to Spokane, Washington and, uh, and just didn't know anybody in town, uh, rented a, a pretty hole in the wall. I think it was a salon before renovated it and then uh, turned it into, it was called the blind buck, um, a little bar. But it crushed it. It, uh, it uh, netted me about uh, five hundred eighty thousand this first year. Oh shit! Then, first uh, year? Yeah, I built it for one hundred twenty five thousand too. What? Yeah, and uh, from scratch. And then about a year and a half later, we uh, we built out another bar and restaurant called the Globe. And when you say we, was it you and Diana? Me and Di- Diana on the second one. Me okay. and myself on the first one, but uh, Diana on the second one. And between the two, they they grossed about two point eight million a year. And we, uh, we crushed it. So I was doing that plus protecting the guy at the same time. And uh, I had those. I had those bars when we had Hunter. And uh, when I was off and I was there, or if Diana was, we were there probably 14, 15 hours a day. And um, and this is probably the fifth or sixth year we've had them. And uh, I just noticed I didn't have any time for my son. So I was like, screw it, D, let's, let's sell these things. And we sold them for a pretty penny. And we... Took all that money, stuffed them into uh, rental property, so it was good. <laughs> Holy shit! Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah, so we were building bars and um, and doing that. We were so we're how, over, how, over workers. <laughs> how long did you have the bars for total? Six years. Yeah, about six. Yeah. The first one for what? Two years? One year? Uh, first one for about a year and a half. And then I built the second one, so we had both of them. So probably four and a half for the second one, six years for the first one. Did you guys have any kind of experience in bars or restaurants or anything? No. Nope. What kind of learning curve was that? It was gnarly, but. <laughs> That's another thing, too, because uh, the person I protected was very knowledgeable in those fields, and um, and I kind of used his knowledge and, uh, you know, his uh, COOs and his freaking CEOs, and they gave me a lot of guidance in that, so they kind of made that learning curve happen pretty quick. If I didn't have that job at the same time, I, I kind of crossed, I used both of the knowledge between both of them and actually pulled them off pretty fast. See, man, and so... You know, I don't have access to a lot of people like that. And a, a lot of people don't have access to high net worth, smart, business-minded people. Yeah. And that's why I'm all about, like, hiring coaches, dude. Yeah. So, some people think it's stupid, and it, I I love it. I have – I'm in a few different mastermind groups. Um, I, I have a business coach that is, like, strictly for my business. Um, I'm in Sean's um, – uh, lion's den thing. Yep. I'm in a real estate mastermind that we talked about last week. And it's like, dude, even if you can get like the thought, like of a trajectory to just change 1% and just change the way you think about something just a little bit. Yeah. It'll change everything that follows. You know what I mean? 100%. So it's like you, 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 you were very blessed to be able to have somebody. Yeah. had a guy. And the one thing that, one thing I did do that nobody taught me <clears throat> is when you go into a town, what I didn't know about bars and stuff like that, it's all, um, who you know, especially in the area, right? If you, if you went over the cool kids, you kind of went over the bar. And the main thing in a in, in the bar industry is the industry, right? So what I would do while I was building out the first one, it took me about three months. Um, I'd go eat at lunch and have a beer at night at a different bar in town and then just talk to the bartenders and servers nonstop, right? 
and tell them what I was doing, invite them over afterwards to see our build, and uh, just pretty much one over the industry in the area. So I didn't even have to do a grand opening. When I first opened, um, I had pretty much every cool bartender, server, bar back in town on a line going in. And uh, with uh, the bar industry, if you bring over the industry, bring over the bartenders, you make it the industry's place, the the patrons will follow. And uh, that's how we kind of, you know, got got so successful so quick. Then after that, then really in the bar industry is really figuring out how people don't steal from you. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's, it's pretty easy, like, uh, or it's pretty, it's a hard thing to learn. Um, but in the bar industry, you have so many bad bartenders, servers, bar backs, cooks. Um, they all, they're all looking for a quick steal. Did and, you get uh, people stole from you oh, a lot? Dude, I mean, honestly, I think the bar industry was more about learning how to stop people from stealing from you. <laughs> it's really? What, yeah. And putting in, uh, if you make it easy for them to steal, they'll do it every time because, you know, it's not being a bartender or anything like that. It's not like a life-term goal. You know, it's right. kind of a, a stepping stone for whatever they want to do next. So they don't look at it like that. You know, they look for the quick buck. So you have to put in all these different steps that it makes it hard for them to steal. They say what, um, you know, dollars will stick to angels' hands, you know, so that's another thing is just figuring all the ways to stop people from stealing. Damn. <laughs> yeah. That had to be stressful too, right? Yeah, it's stressful. It it was cool because it makes you the cool guy in town, you know? And, um, like, I became – I got the grand – or grand marshal of the city. They gave me a key to the city. Really? Um, yeah. They uh, put me as the main person through a parade because I um, renovated a part of town that was kind of – a little bit grungy and turned it in kind of the hot bar spot because after we opened up about eight bars opened up around us and it be, became the big uh, bar area and stuff like that. So it was good. I learned a lot. I'll never do it again. No, <laughs> no. Why? It takes too much hands. Whoever counts the money wins. So you have to be there always counting the money. Just remember that whoever counts the money in the bar industry wins. So any bar, any restaurant, and also too, you got to think in those, um, in that industry too, it's the only only industry you're taking things from raw, preparing them and selling them um, all in one spot. You know, a lot of times you're, you know, your uh, our product's already made and you're selling that. But in a bar, you're making it from scratch and then having to deal with the customers afterwards. It's uh, I think the bar industry or the nightclub industry or the restaurant industry is probably one of the hardest industries to to make it. And at the end of that, you're hoping to make twenty percent, hoping, you know. Uh, um, that's really what it is. And it's, it's a lot of work. And if you really break it down and say, say you're making, you know, six, 700,000 bucks a year, but if you really break down the hours and stuff like that, sometimes you're working for maybe 20, 30 bucks an hour, depending yeah. on what you're, what you're doing. So, uh, great for, um, a single guy, great for a person that doesn't have kids. Um, but if you have kids, it really takes every bit of an ounce, um, every bit of time from your kids away. So yeah. that's why we sold them. And you were you were living out here when you joined or no? No, I was a uh, I left high school um, like literally like two hours after I graduated. I had a seventy six van bit up, built out, and uh, we became me and three buddies became snow bums. So we just worked as lift operators in Mount Hood, and then uh, Bill Hops and Bill, and just got free lift tickets and skied and snowboard. Just living the bachelor life. Yeah, like just. Like little scumbags, you know, smoking weed and freaking. <laughs> what made you decide to join? Uh, my, it was funny because uh, I was a pretty good wrestler in high school, and uh, I was a pretty good student too. My parents really wanted me to go to college, and obviously I was burned out from wrestling, burned out from school. So I just took off, wanted to live a nomad life, and my uh, my family is pretty good put together. They're not wealthy; they are now, but like um, they weren't wealthy at the time. But they're really really strong values put together. And my mom was just so disappointed in me. So I think one day, um, it's probably about a year, year and a half after I left high school, she was just like, are you just going to be a loser your whole life? <laughs> and I can be Fuck, a ski really? bum. Yeah. And I was like, I felt so bad. And my mom's an awesome person. So, um, I was in uh, Colorado at the time and I was like thinking of something cool to do. And, uh, so I was like, you know what, I'll just join the military. So I went down to the the Navy recruiter, and I was like, I want to be in the Army. They're like, well, this is the Navy. No idea about the military. <laughs> Zero idea. And uh, they're like, well, this is the Navy. And I was like, all right, I want to be in the Navy. They're like, what do you want to do? I'm like, I don't know. What What do you can do, you know? And uh, 
I didn't go in as a SEAL. I went in because I had no idea even the SEALs or anything like that. I went in as a rescue swimmer with an, with an air crew, kind of air crew rescue swimmer. We jump out of helicopters. and You did that? Yeah, I did that oh for, uh, yeah, for, and so like, uh, joined, went in and, um, it was before September 11th or anything like that on my first deployment to the Middle East. And, um, and then that's when we, uh, we, I brought it or sorry, what are we talking about? We're talking about how I got in, right? How you got in, but, but you brought up that you started as a rescue swimmer. Rescue swimmer I want to yeah. dive into that. What, what the fuck was that like? Uh, it's, it's honestly pretty hard school. So like you have to go down to Pensacola, you have to go through air crew school first, and then you have to go, it's RSS, uh, rescue swimmer school. And it's just shit loads of swimming. And, um, I think we started with like 50 people and you end up graduating with like 25. So it's pretty high attrition rate. And, um, but I crushed it and ended up going in the ZAT. And did you have to actually you know, go rescue people? I did. Uh, you know, we had, there's a place in the middle of the Gulf called Kamensky. It's where before the Iraq war, you had a lot of smugglers that would come out of, um, the SA and KA, the two uh, Iraqi rivers coming out. Mm -hmm. And when they uh, when they're smuggling, they'll they would hit two areas where cut into international waters, and um, if they cut into that, you'd bring a team in, um, whether it be seals. I think they used uh, Coast Guard uh, fast teams, but a lot of seals, and they would take down the smugglers and bring them to a place called Kamensky, which is like a holding pattern of like hundreds and hundreds of ships in the middle of the Persian Gulf. And a storm kicked up, kicked up one time, and uh, a bunch of them sunk. And I think at one time there's like. 200 people in the water through oh. the night. Yeah, so we got some rescues during that and stuff. It was pretty cool. Was that your Was that your first one? Yeah, our first one. What yeah. was your, What was going through your head, dude? I don't know. I was like, yeah, let's fucking rescue some people. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like, dude, you're because was it storming when you were going out there? Yeah, yeah, big seas. So you're fucking riding in a helicopter, right? Yeah, and the worst thing about the Persian Gulf is there's these sea snakes everywhere. Every, oh, you, fuck! Like no. these little nope. brown sea snakes. It's <laughs> what so you're swimming through, and you have to push them out of the out of the way a bunch too. Yeah. What? Yeah, I hate those things. You see them everywhere in the Persian Gulf. But no, yeah, I, I was I was pumped to get into it. You know, I mean, the anxiety had to be through the roof, right? Yeah, I don't think I don't know. You're pumped. You're, you're, you're young. Pumped. You don't really yeah. think about shit. You know, I was like uh, 20 years old then, so I was like, let's get on it. <laughs> yeah, and you just dive out, right, or do you do you lower in, or no? You jump out of a so you do either 10 for 10, 10 feet for 10 knots, or 15 for zero. And what is that? Jump, or the how fast the helo, the helicopter is going. You just jump out of the helicopter, swim up to him, pull him in, hook him up, raise him up, and then you get pulled up afterwards. People no, think, trying to fight you and shit? No, nah, they're excited. Yeah. <laughs> I think the afterwards, there's a bunch of dead people in the water, like a couple days later, and we had to jump in and pull out the dead people and, like, flip them over, and their whole faces are eaten up by fish or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, it's was, it was pretty gnarly. Was that I, hard? I ended up pulling one of the guys, and, like, uh, he's been waterlogged for so long. He ended up pulling on his arm, and his arm kind of comes loose. Yeah, they're all s soaked up. It might have been like six days after. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> the only thing I I didn't like that though because I was like I don't want to jump in, man. There's fucking sharks in there. <laughs> you know that's what I was thinking. If really? There's dead people in the water, yeah. But there's not too many sharks in the Persian Gulf, so it's not too bad. I mean, did that was that like your first encounter with a deceased person in the military? Yeah, I've never seen any dead people. Yeah, and the first time. I mean, did, what was that like? I mean, they seem like I don't. Know, I mean, what was what was it like for you? Like, was it traumatic? Did it? No, no. I was just sitting like, ah, this fucker's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, dude. <laughs> this that, fucker's dead, man. <laughs> did you guys pull him up? Yeah, I pulled him up. We had to put him on a litter because he's falling apart. So you bring down a litter, put him on, and bring him up in the helo. In like pieces or something? Or? Oh, he, that's why you put him in the litter so he's not in pieces. Oh, man. Because if you put him in a strop, maybe he'd fall apart. What's but a litter? A litter's like a, a stretcher board. Oh, you gotcha. Put out of the helo, yeah. The other one's like a basket, I'm assuming, right? Yeah, we didn't have baskets, so just litters. No? Baskets take up a lot of room, yeah. Gotcha. Rescue baskets, no, yeah. So you were you were doing the rescue swimming for a while? Doing the rescue swimming, and it was on that deployment um, where I first had my first encounter with SEALs. And um, when they take down the smugglers coming out of the uh, out of Iraq, uh, we'd bring a sniper up with us in our in our helicopter. And, uh, and I seen these guys hit these boats, and I was like, what fucking job is this? They're like, oh, we're SEALs, man. And kind of my first, because, I, you know, prior to, you know, 2001, there wasn't, I mean, what the only SEAL movie I think was the Charlie Sheen movie. You know, yeah. there wasn't all these books and stuff out there. And I was never, I didn't really care about the military that much in high school. So I didn't really know that much about it. And uh, if I knew about SEALs, I would have gone in as a SEAL. But uh, my recruiter never told me about it really. So um, now everybody talks about SEALs. Can you go in as just as, like, can you start as a SEAL? Yeah, it's called SEAL Challenge. You can go right in. To it 
Damn. Has it always been like that? I don't think so because before we, you have to get an A school, like, and then you go to SEALs afterwards, but now you can streamline right in. Damn. Um, but in my time, it was, uh, you know, it wasn't, there's no social media. There's none of that kind of stuff. So back in my day, back in my day, I sound like, <laughs> <laughs> shut up, boomer. <laughs> I'm just joking. Oh man. So, so, so you saw them. I saw them taking these people out. Uh, yeah. Taking these smugglers out. And I just was like, fuck, this is a way cooler job than my job. Right. <laughs> so, uh, they were on the, our frigate for, um, a couple months <clears throat> and, um, uh, I was like, you know, I'm in good shape and I was in incredible shape back then. And so, uh, they're like, well, let's see your pull-ups and this stuff. And I think at the time I could do like 48 pull-ups or something like that. Some crazy amount and it's fast. 48, run. 48 straight. Yeah. Yeah. I could do a shitload. I could see you still do over 30 now. So really? Yeah. Straight. I'm good. At, I got big lats. I can do a lot of pull-ups. Yeah, I'm good for like eight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shut the fuck up. Really? <laughs> oh man. Oh man. No. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, bro, you weren't supposed to say that. <laughs> Pull ups are my thing, man. I could do a bunch. Well, anyways, they, they knew I was in shape, and so I did my screener in Bahrain, in the uh, Middle East, and then uh, went to Buds when I came back. Damn. So it was, uh, and it's, I'm, it's funny too because a lot of people know about Buds now, like Hell Week and all that stuff, and yeah. I really didn't know about much about it. I, you know, I heard like kind of why I was doing the screening, and they were telling me about it, like, ah, oh, I was like, so what's the training like? And they're like, well, you know, you, Hell Week's six and a half days without sleep shit like that and i was like no way you can't do six and a half days without sleep that's what i thought i thought they were like fucking kinda... with you <laughs> and yeah obviously you start talking more once i got into it because i went to buds not too long after that and you started looking into it more and more and i'm like fuck what you know i i'm kind of was like ignorant about it and um you know joined did you um, get humbled real quick not really i don't know i i, I went to buds and it did suck but I crushed it, man. I freaking, you know, I did, I did, I set the O course record that hadn't been set for like 12 years. I crushed it, man. And, um, I actually, I didn't mind buds. It was, it did suck. It was like uh, a lot of no sleep, um, cold, you're cold, wet, miserable a lot of time, but a lot of competition and you kind of bond with a lot of dudes. And, uh, um, and I just, you know, it's, it pays to be a winner is what they say. And I fucking won everything in buds. <laughs> so. Was there any like life changing events that happened to you during that time though? Like, I think I think the biggest thing because I was a small kid in high school. I graduated. I wrestled one forty one my senior year. So, um, you know, I was a tiny guy. I didn't get picked on. I wasn't like the fucking door kid, but I also wasn't the cool kid either. But I didn't have a lot of confidence. Did you get a lot of fights. Uh, a little bit. I got in one big fight in high school. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I fucking crushed a dude in high school. <laughs> and it gave that gave me some confidence too. My dad always said use your wrestling, and I was a good wrestler. So, did a belly to belly and, and freaking put him on his face and broke his eye socket. And that. so I learned how to fight at a young age. I wasn't scared about that, but still a young kid, you're still skinny. You know, you start, but when you start winning stuff, and um, you know, in buds, there's there's people that are Olympic athletes. There's there's pro football players that come into it. You know, there's a lot of things, and when you see that, like you could compete against him and even be tough for them tougher than them and then um and then beat them in a lot of stuff you you get a lot of confidence and i so i um becoming a seal was probably or going to buzz to become a seal was probably the biggest life-changing thing i i went through in my life uh it gave me kind of a timid kid confidence that i was a badass and um and uh i'm thankful for that and it's carried with me today you know yeah man yeah 100 percent. yeah i don't think i can do it what buds yeah why? I don't know. I, I I probably could do it. I'm just I'm telling myself that I can't already before even really knowing what it entails, man. I just you I mean, it from like my side of things, you hear these stories of like sitting in ice cold water for like days with boats over your head or some shit. Well, I always I always have I'm always kind of that mindset. I want to see where what this, the next horizon or sorry. I want to see over the horizon what next to come right i never understood the guys that quit because they obviously went into the teams or went into buds because they want to do something different see what's cool out there right and then when it gets hard they're ready to go back to their old life that they weren't happy with or why would they even go to buds in the beginning so right. i never understood like you're quitting why you okay you're gonna go back to your note your old boring life you know because i'm assuming most people go into that because they're bored with their life they want to do something cool but they're not willing to, you know, truck it out a little bit longer to see what's over the horizon. I never understood that. Yeah. And so everybody says like, 
did you think about quitting? I'm like, no, I, I wanted to see what was next. I'm like, yeah, this sucks, but, you know, it'll be over soon, you know? You think that's what kept you going, though? Yeah. So that's, that has to be, like, the only thing that kept you going, right? Yeah. I mean, just constantly thinking, like, all right, what's next? What's next? What's next? You know, like, uh, um, you know, I wrestled from a young age, from about four or five, and wrestling, for anybody that knows it, that truly wrestled and competed, wrestling sucks, right? Because you're, you're dieting in my, in my day. <laughs> like, you're always cutting, you know, 15, 20 pounds. You're never... You never, you can't drink, go out and party. You're just fucking miserable. Wrestling's a miserable sport. You know, they, Dan Gable says once, once you've wrestled, everything else in life is easy because uh, you're always injured. You're always hurting. Um, you're always tired. You're always starving. And then you're having to compete at the same time. So I'm very lucky I went through that because I thought that was the norm. You know, um, it is miserable. But once you live in misery, you kind of adapt to that miserable situation and everything else doesn't seem as miserable anymore. So, <clears throat> so going into buds just seems like another wrestling season for me. And, um, and so, yeah, so I didn't, I didn't really care how miserable it was. I just, it'll be over soon. It doesn't last forever. And then I want to see what's next. I want to see what other cool things are going on. And plus you're young, you want to get laid. So being a seal also gets you laid too. So. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, so what was it like after completing that? I mean, you know, it's funny. Uh, Did you just go straight to? So you go to, yeah, Buds is about six, seven months long. Then you go through Airborne, which is uh, an army school that's in Fort Benning um, for whatever, a month or so. And then you go through SQT, SEAL Qualification Training, which is another five or six months. And then you get your Trident, and then you go to your team after that. Um, me, I was I was pumped to get the Trident. Um and uh, really, I was always nervous about Hell Week. I didn't know, like, everybody's, I was like, everybody quits for hell, what's going on, you know, what kind of crazy thing it was. And when I figured out that Hell Week wasn't that bad, um, I think that was when I was most pumped because I knew once you get through Hell Week, yeah, I was a good swimmer and all that stuff, so I just freaking cruised through, which I did pretty good with. But, yeah, you go to your team after that, and <laughs> one thing you don't know about, I, know I think today it's changed a little bit, but back in that time, like, uh, you get hazed as a new guy, man. Really? Oh, dude. Bad? A year and a half of freaking dealing doing with old guys, man. They fuck you up, dude. Really? <laughs> yeah, dude. A year and a half? Yeah, because you do your work, your workups about a year and a half before you deploy. And, uh, you know, the old guys, they, they freaking, they make sure, you know, this is before all the hazing became illegal and all that yeah. stuff, you know. So, yeah, you get hazed. And that was, that's definitely, uh, that year and a half as a new guy seal definitely sucks. A lot yeah. of guys lose their tridents after that, through that, too, because if they're, if you're you're being hazed, there's good and bad hazings. Um, if you're a shit bag, <laughs> yeah. If you're a shit bag, they'll haze you more. You really? Know? Yeah, yeah. And they'll they'll show you kind of through that stuff. So like, it's um, like the worst you saw. Oh man, I don't know if we could talk about it. Really? <laughs> yeah. All right. I mean, I got I got hazed pretty bad once. Uh, the um, <laughs> I got my whole body taped up and uh, thrown in an ice bath for like probably 45 minutes. Where I'm kind of hyping out. They make you dr drink like 12 beers. Give you a bunch of pink bellies where they slap your uh, fins across your belly and tell, pretty much till your uh, your freaking belly's bleeding. And then you get a happy helmet, which is like your your face taped below your nose all the way over your head with a handle on top of it. <laughs> so it was bad. So it was like, and then you know you get and while you're in an ice bath for 45 minutes. Yeah, yeah, it was bad, man. I was I came out pretty pretty blue, you know. Holy so, fuck! And that's one, you know. So. I mean that that yeah definitely hazing back in the day was gnarly. That's but, why you but, really, but you want it you want it though you know yeah. like you every every team guy back in the day did it. so like uh, um, you want to prove yourself. Well, you just and like the guys that are hazing you they went through it so you don't you don't want to be the guy that's not hazed fucking haze me let's do this I want to be yeah. part of the brotherhood you know so so that's that's kind of is but you know I don't know. So that's why the first time oh. I did the uh, the cold plunge at your house. Oh yeah! Like, Shut up, Diana. He's fine. <laughs> yeah, he's fine. Yeah, I was like, "Fuck, dude! I don't know. It was the first time I ever done anything like that. Yeah. I don't know." Which that's obviously nothing, but but I mean, it's it's a miserable situation, you know. Once you once you accept it and kind of live in that misery, it's not that bad. Damn, dude, that sucks. Yeah. What was the happy helmet? They taped you where? So you tape you get taped below the nose, all the way around your head, around your ears, so you're completely closed off. You can only breathe through your mouth. And then you have like a handle, uh, a freaking. Uh, What's the handle for? pull you around <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. like yeah drag you around yeah it sucks the only good thing is <laughs> this is this is a good thing i was really good at jujitsu right i'm still good at jujitsu but they uh my chief found out i was good at jujitsu 
And he's like, oh, I think you can tap out the whole platoon or whatever. And uh, I was like, yeah, man, I think I can. And they freaking, uh, we went in and they, they rolled around with me. I pretty much smoked everybody over a couple hours. And after that, they, they didn't haze me as much. Really? So, yeah. yeah. Like, as, right. as soon as they know, yeah, as, if you're tough. That's why I always say, like, uh, one with my son, I want him always to be a good fighter. Whether you use it, I'm not saying to be a bully or that kind of stuff, but, like, if you're a good fighter and you know you could whoop the shit out of 90% of the world out there, right? It gives you a confidence, and if and if people know that you can whoop the shit out of ninety percent of the people out there, they give you a type of confidence. So, whether I, I know nowadays fighting is kind of like taboo, everybody's like kinder, gentler world, but but um, you know, men should fight to be able to crush people. Yeah, you know, I think so. Yeah, I I agree. Yeah, yeah. So my son's already a badass, he's choking out kids left and right. So I have to be careful of it. <laughs> He's only, he's only six. <laughs> How long has he been in jiu-jitsu for? Three. Since he's three, three years. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, he's going to be a beast when he's older. Yeah, he's all, I mean, he's already now, like, we have to teach him, like, don't use your jiu-jitsu at school, man. You got to be careful. Are you on phone calls already? No, but, yeah, kind of. <laughs> Just, like, he, well, I, I made the mess up one time. We, like, um, he would, he would not do his jiu-jitsu at school. And then one time I found out that a kid, like, gave him an Indian broom and kind of slammed him to the ground. I'm like, look. I said, don't use jujitsu, but if somebody touches you and they're hurting you, use it. Well, then he used it. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. So I don't know what I don't know what the right answer is there. <laughs> I mean, he's got to stick up for himself. <laughs> yeah. No. But the uh, but the the uh, level of violence he could bring is maybe too much for a six year old. Yeah. <laughs> so he can bring yeah, a level. Yeah. Really? Yeah. He's he's good, man. He's good. He can bring he can bring a level. That's probably why ever your daughter likes him so much, dude. Probably. <laughs> yeah. I know. I, I forgot who I was talking to yesterday. I was like, yeah, I think, uh, I th- I, you know, I think Everly's gonna end up dating Hunter one day or whatever it is. And they're like, well, at least he's at least he's in good hands. I'm like, yeah, you're, you know, you're right. <laughs> yeah. I'm okay with this. Yeah, you I know. know? And He'll protect her. And he's, you know, what he's a he's a sweetheart when it comes to girls, you know. So yeah, uh, yeah, we just gotta watch him. <laughs> they play good together. Yeah. Uh, so, um, Hell Week. Hell Week. You, you you get through Hell Week. Yep. And then when was your first deployment after Hell Week? You, you said a year and a half? No, you, almost two years after that. So two years of just shitbag hazing. Yep. <laughs> yep shitbag hazing. Where was your first deployment? Philippines, actually. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. how was that? It was good. There's like a uh, terrorist organization down there called Abu Sayyaf. Um, it's just terrorists, and uh, they're Filipino terrorists. They live in southern Mindanao. We go down down there as advisors. <clears throat> um, we trained their NAV SOG, which is their Navy SEALs and their uh, force recon and, uh, to fight these pretty much, um, you know, just Muslim terrorists or whatever. It's actually a fun time. Like <laughs> the, uh, I went down there and like really got into it. We were living in Nipah huts in the middle of the jungle. I bought a bunch of fighting cocks and I was fighting fighting cocks. I bought a monkey for a dollar, you know, <laughs> yeah, I had a, a monkey named Sabuku. I had two fighting cocks, uh, El Diablo, Magic Man, they're badass, dude. <laughs> I'd find him at this place called the Cockpit. Like, is that like a normal thing down there? Yeah, but, I mean, I, I don't know anymore, but chicken fighting's huge down there. Really? Yeah, yeah. Was it like frowned upon, or that was like the normal out there? Uh, Filipinos love fighting. They they boxing. They I think they have horse fights in some places. They have sp- you can do, do spider. Did you just fight. say horse fights? Horse fights. They have, they bring like a mare in with two studs, and they have horse fights. They bet on fighting nonstop. They love fighting. It's a big fighting culture. <clears throat> so um, I thought, you know, I was like, all right, they were big, big into fight cock or cock fighting or whatever. I was like, yeah, let's learn the local populace. I'm going to get a couple fighting cocks myself, you know. So I bought them, bought two of them. Um, you give them like D ball and you, you, yeah, D-ball. you is it like steroids, <laughs> like a little D ball, get them all pumped oh, up. Yeah, you like got to drop them like a couple times. Like you train them every day. So like you, uh, you throw them up the air team times every morning. 10 times every night so they were flying big because whatever usually the highest flying cock is usually the freaking uh the one that kills the most so train them like that and you run them across the ground and get them in shape and then you uh take them to uh, uh it was called a, a cockpit and then they fight and they have these little blades in the back of their spurs that are uh, maybe about an inch and a half two inches long and they fly up and they nail them what it was really crazy it's like the one i thought that was gonna win el diablo <laughs> <laughs> actually like he it was the highest flying one this kind of stuff and he was lighter and i thought he was gonna whoop all these cocks fights or all these cocks you know and like uh he actually ended up uh losing right away and i'm like fuck dude and then i was left with this uh 
the magic man, the the fat cock, you know. <laughs> what's crazy is he couldn't fly that high, but he was badass. So like when he would they go to fight, he'd roll onto his back and stab up, and he was like just. This is fat Tubular that just fought from the bottom up, and he actually fought like seven fights, and um, and one I actually won a lot of money off him, and I was and everybody was like, oh, you know, that's crazy, that cock's crazy, you know. So I ended up eating him afterwards. Yeah, I wanted to accept his energy. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that's sick. <laughs> yeah, it's sick. Yeah. How did you have time to do that? Uh, you do like you know in, in deployments you have a lot of time. You do ops, but then right. you have a lot of time off, and you know you just go to those local areas and stuff. It's cool. All right, sorry, we got off track there a little bit. Uh, so, um, Afghanistan. Afghanistan's nuts. Good firefights. Nobody died. We had an officer that got his legs blown off, Dan Kanasin, in the first, like, 36 hours after we got there on an op. But other than that, everybody else was pretty good the whole time. Let me ask you a question. What is it that pushes you through this shit? Like, <clears throat> dude, being in a position of where you have to take people's lives. Yeah. Being in a position where you have people around you that are losing their lives. Yeah. This shit's got to be fucking hard, dude. I don't... And everybody has their own perspective and, and whatever it is. Regardless, seeing that stuff changes the way you feel, the way you think, whatever it is. Like, what What was, like... Well, get, think of this, right? You, <clears throat> you're training for a year and a half for every deployment, right? Maybe do two, three, four deployments. You're, you're doing, you know, three, four years of direct action training. Kill house, sniping, freaking blowing things up. You just train, train, think about it. That's all you're doing, just warrior spirit, right? And uh, so once you get into it and you're with eight, ten of your best friends that you know have just been trained the same, you know have no quit in them. You know that no matter what happens, they have your back and they'll crush anything, right? I always liked it because patrolling out in front, being point man, walking, I always felt like I was um, walking with the pride of lions, ready to crush everybody. So I... I never was really scared or nervous just because I knew that every one of my guys or one of my buddies are worth a hundred of those guys. And I just don't think anybody was, anybody can deal with the amount of violence that we can bring to them. And so if anything, I was more pumped up during it all. Yeah. And I miss it. That's what I miss more than anything. The thrill. The thrill of just being with homies that are fucking ruthless, crazy, ready to go animals and take it to the enemy you know i'll never find that again that uh that confidence or that kind of uh thing and i'm not just saying like me like yeah i know i could bring it to him but have him being backed by just freaking pipe hitting badasses you know and being around that you know and that's um you know that's before family life before wives before any of that stuff just ruthless warriors that are ready to crush anybody true pipe hitters true freaking guys i'm not talking about Nowadays, I've heard people tattletelling on each other and fucking whatever's happening. The teams are now the kinder, gentler world. Back then, we were just freaking animals and we were freaking ready to crush everybody. And so I, I never was really worried about, you know, dying or then shooting. I just think that we were almost invincible. Lions walking through a freaking pride of lions just walking through the middle of Afghanistan, ready to crush everybody. Damn. Yeah. I mean, that's what I thought at the time. Looking back, I'm like, ah, you could probably be a little careful. <laughs> but, you know, that's what, that's what happens in life when you, <clears throat> when you have a, you know, wealth or you have a family and you have kids, you know, you get more and more, I feel like, helicopter dad. And, you know, but back then when you're just, you know, the, the SIL teams and, and special forces or if you go that route, it's a very selfish or selfish uh, occupation. You know, you, you don't really have time for family and girlfriends or whatever that is it's it's all about you your homies and being warriors you never got in a situation where it's like fuck i might not make it out of here yeah there's a couple it didn't, you don't ever know it's that situation till after it's done <laughs> but really? like after it's done you're like fuck <laughs> yeah i got pinned down <clears throat> i was trying to snipe um, um like there's two bad guys firing back and forth with this and i was trying to um, do overwatch and um they were shooting at us but i was behind like a wall and all of a sudden I started taking rounds and I felt them hitting around me. Like I felt like the dirt popping up around me. And I was like, how the fuck are they shooting me? Like what's going on? And uh, at this point, all my buddies jumped off the roof. <laughs> and I didn't know because I was kind of in my scope the whole time. And I re realized at this point there, what was happening, I didn't realize until afterwards. I, but at this point they're at the, in the mountain behind me shooting down at me. And I had no idea. 
And so all I hear is my buddy uh, going, roll right. <laughs> and I can, so I just slowly roll off the roof and fall off of like a 20 foot roof. Didn't even notice the fall. I was like, huh, huh, you know, and uh, I was like, fuck me, dude. And then um, you rolled uh, off a 20 foot roof and just fucking, I didn't even notice I rolled off. I was just like fucking excited to be alive, you know, kind of thing. And then uh, it's funny because we're like, we're moving out. I was like, I left my sniper rifle on top of the roof. I was like, just a second. <laughs> just a second. <laughs> but my homie was there, and he's like, he saw I was still shook up. He's like, I'll get you. And he walked up there in a fucking rain of bullets, taking grab my sniper rifle, and I was good to go. So, But, yeah, that one I was a little sketched. <laughs> that took a little bit to shake off. But, you know, <clears throat> firefights, when they happen, you, you know, you uh, your muscle memory kicks in. Right. So all the stuff you train, that's when it kicks in your, your mag changes, your shooting, that kind of stuff. You don't, in your tactics say you train over and over and over again, that kicks in during the middle of the firefight. Um, it's not until everything calms down and you reflect on what happened. You're like, ah, it was a little sketchy, but when it happens, you, that's why you train so much. You know, you don't, you don't have time. You don't think you just, your muscle memory kicks in. Do you and think any of that training has helped you with like your everyday life now? <sighs> I think the, um, the confidence of of being that um it carries with me today so I don't, i'm not scared of any man you know a lot of people um, maybe get starstruck by people or they look up or maybe they're intimidated and i'm just i'm not intimidated i don't get starstruck by people i don't um i just i'm scared of no man and i think every man that i see i can do that maybe more if i choose to so right. i think more of the confidence that of me doing that in life um you know, people know, I mean, deep down they say, they think, and they know it's one of the hardest things you can do, right? That's why people to go do it. What do you mean? You become a SEAL mm. and go to war. You know, even pro athletes, they might be pro athletes, but deep down a lot of them are like, fuck, I wonder if I go to war and be with the best and do that kind of stuff. Billionaires, millionaires, they all kind of, they might have been successful in the thing, but deep down every, every man wants to be a badass hunter that yeah. crushes bad guys. That's just our spirit. So me knowing that I've done that and was the best and went to war and came back and freaking was a good operator, um, it gives me the confidence to really talk to anybody without feeling intimidated. So right. I think that's, that's what's carried me over more than anything. That's amazing. Well, what was it that you said to me the other night um, about like when you're in any given situation? Oh, uh, you mean opportunity? No, it was like... Uh, you know, when, when you're put in these situations of them being your enemy, you don't think about anything else besides, like, they're my enemy and I'm their enemy. Yeah, and they're, I, I don't think, like, you know, like, oh, I wonder what their family's like or anything like that. All I know at the time is, is they're fighting me, I'm fighting them, I'm going to fucking crush them, you know? Yeah. That's, that's the way it is, you know? And, and when you go to war, that's why another thing, too, I feel like, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of things that happen, like the Eddie Gallery situation, like these people that are saying like well he he fought too much this is war this is murder or this kind of stuff like it's war man war is war you know there's there's no easy way to f fight it there's a lot of gray area and you try to do the best you can but at the end of the day you want to be an animal and you want to take it to the enemy you know okay. I, I don't like it i don't like that nowadays people are trying to police soldiers into doing the right or wrong if you are like what about vietnam world war ii fucking we were ruthless during those times you know um, I, I just think war should be war and should, we shouldn't judge our soldiers and they should fucking fight war and come home alive, whatever they have to do to come home alive. We can't even decide what to call people these days. Yeah. <laughs> fucking, I don't know, man. It's, you know what, you know, that whole thing who says that like, you know, weak time or strong times produce weak men or whatever, ever that's saying. Uh, it's, uh, it's hard times create hard men and soft times create. What is it? No, hard times create um, strong men. Strong men create weak times. Weak, or sorry, strong, uh, sorry. <laughs> oh, it's like hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. Weak men create hard times. You know, it's a, it's a vicious cycle. And I think, I think that um, our society these days, I think it's, it's, it's such, we live in such a bubble of safety and, and freaking a blanket of safety that, that are, you know, people before us have created, hard men have created that we make up these rules and we argue about these arbitrary things about 
fucking hurt feelings and fucking puppies that make you feel happy and, and fucking all this shit. So I think right now we we're creating a kind of a weaker society. And I, I think, I think, um, well, dude, we can't even say we're fucking American anymore. You can't say they're, try, they're trying to fucking cancel the fact that you could say that you can't say we're American anymore. Yeah. That you're supposed to say U S citizen. Cause it might piss somebody off. Yeah. I, I don't, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know why. Like, uh, fuck. Yeah. It's, it's, We'll see what's happening. All I can do is is um, is um, raise my son to be strong, strong man that can uh, crush. And if you think about it, it's not the, so much bad thing because if there is a bunch of uh, pussies out there this day in society, right? Um, when my son gets to where he can capitalize and be successful, is less competition for him. <laughs> you know? Sure. So, yeah. So he'll just get the hottest chick and freaking uh, and make the best business decisions. You know. <laughs> make really- the mo- <clears throat> make the- <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I, all I can do, I don't, I try not to worry about, um, the people in society that I think are weak and really get into the weeds or politics. I just, I don't care. All I can do is, um, you know, be a good leader for my family and raise my kids. Awesome. Which, dude, you're doing a great job. Yeah. I mean, you guys got to fucking down, dude. We got like, down, both of you guys are fucking business owners. Both of you guys crush it in business. Both of you guys are amazing parents. You know, you, you got Hunter, you got the baby girl. Yeah. Like, I mean, you guys are doing good. Do yeah. you guys do you guys work with each other a lot and oh, each other businesses? Oh, like, we do. Do you help with? Yeah. His, for those of you guys don't know, his wife owns a uh, an apparel company Salty called Honey. Salty Honey, and yep. then, isn't there another one? Another what one that dropped or something? It's like a oh House of Honey, House of Honey, House and of that's, Honey. That's more of like a yeah, it's like, like a boutique. Boutique. So, so yeah, so they they manufacture Salty Honey from scratch. Uh, House of Honey is they uh, buy clothes from different dealers. And they put together outfits. Gotcha. They don't produce that. They don't produce that stuff from scratch. They just buy from different um, wholesalers and they make their outfits out of it. And make cute outfits and then people buy those outfits. Does uh, does she help you with the ammo company? Yeah. Do you help her with Salty Honey? Yeah. Are you the model for all the... No. <laughs> <laughs> you got to try the spandex or the, no, the yeah. leggings on? No, I just, I just sit there and fill orders when she needs me to. Honestly, my... Uh, you know, I, I come and go depending on what's going on, like with uh, the show or stuff like that. But my wife kind of holds down the household, so I just like, what do you need me to do? And she puts me to work. <laughs> yeah, wh- what's what's that like for you? For like, as far as like, do you guys like set, I guess, roles of like, hey, you know, I got the shit going on. You got to hold down the house, or yeah, we just we kind of naturally do. We don't really set rules or anything. We just flow off of it. Um, you know, with uh, I went through a lot of girls and a lot of relationships in my life. You know, and you know, I always, always try to get the hottest one or whatever it was. But as soon as I met D, all bets are off, dude. And there is, you know, I'd, I guess with the hardest thing with me, like girls in the past, I wish I could meet a girl that's hot as fuck and still has a Navy SEAL attitude, right? Like a Navy SEAL with a vagina. <laughs> I wish I could. I always say that to my friends, you know. And uh, Diane is exactly that. Freaking uh, just a fucking badass chick, um, an alpha, and uh, and a homie where I can talk eye to eye and we bounce ideas off each other it's not there's no hierarchy in it you know obviously i'm the man of the family i do the leadership stuff but we don't we do everything together and right. um and yeah she's my best friend so can you define that leadership stuff what do you mean like like, uh, like you're the man of the family you like uh like say she'll have an idea uh, what to do financially and um, maybe i'll have an idea or you know we're and we're talking about it but i'll usually come with the final decision to, right uh, like to finally say like, yeah, you're right. Let's do this. You know? And she, I don't know if that's the right or wrong way to do it. Um, she, there's believe, no right or wrong way. She believes, she believes in that. She believes that, um, the male's the head of the household. Um, and you know, we're the leader, whether you like it or not, you know, we're built stronger. And, uh, and so, um, so yeah, I usually I come with the final decision and then, uh, she backs me up or if sometimes if I come up with a bad decision, you know, she accepts it, but maybe she'll give me a little bit of feedback. <laughs> I'm like, all right. But, Brian, uh, you fucking idiot. <laughs> yeah. But she, yeah. but it, 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 it's not a, it's not a full dictatorship. It's more like, uh, she's like, oh, I like these three ideas. What do you think? And I was like, well, I like this one out of it. And she's like, all right, let's go with that one. Yeah. So it's kind of that kind uh, of it's stuff. It's teamwork. Teamwork. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know, and I wasn't trying to portray it as like, Hey, like, you're the dictator of the household. No, you know but, I mean, hopefully you didn't take it like that. No, but she, she, uh, she, she likes me to be the leader and right. she does that. And she, uh, you know, because also too, I'm 10 years older than her, you know, I've went through a lot of life too. 
Damn, and, you're 10 years older than her? Yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, man. Dude, Siri always gives me shit because I'm five years older than her. Oh, I'm 10, <laughs> 10 years, man. I got her young. <laughs> Damn. Freaking cradle robber. Yeah, I know. But, you know, with her, too, like, when I first met her, she's only 23, but she already owned her first house, like, looking to buy another one kind of stuff. Like, she's she's a pretty motivated freaking 23. More, She was more put together than and than girls that I was beating eight, nine years older than her. You know? So, right. like, uh, she threw me off, too. I was like, I thought she would say like 27, 28, and she said 23. I'm like, fuck, all right. <laughs> well, she was doing good with like the whole monster thing, right? That's what, I mean, that's Monster, what, yeah, she was, um, and she was X Games, Monsters, uh, announcing the off-road races in Mexico. She was doing a lot of stuff. So. And she was in the middle of all that when you met her, right? Yeah. It was, she was kind of just starting to peek up from all that stuff. Was that hard for you? No, no. No, no for, like why? Like jealousy or something? Yeah, I mean, uh, dude, I mean, you're in a, you're, you're, dude, Let's be honest. You you were dating a girl at the time in a male dominated sport, and yeah. every dude in that thing want like thought your wife was smoking hot. I don't really get to. I mean, supercross guys are all kind of built like jockeys, so I'm not really too. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. But uh, and not that they were like a Navy SEAL; they were just a fucking other dirt bike rider. Yeah. But it's like you know what? Because um, I'll be I'm, open and honest, I'm a jealous dude. There was there was probably times I was jealous. You know, uh, depending on there was a, we actually broke up for a little bit. And, uh, um, that kind of year, eight months leading up to it, I could feel her kind of break it like feeling it. I probably got more jealous during that time, but, uh, but also she's a weird girl, man. She's like, uh, like she's probably one of the most honest people I've ever met. And it was hard for me because most people are a little shady. You yeah. Know, you're always trying to figure out what she's saying, what's a lie, what's that stuff. Yep. But like, you know, Dinah went to jail, um, uh, at like 14, 15 years old, like, uh, not jail, but it's like a, uh. Uh, camp it's in the middle it's oh like yeah yeah one of those it was actually out past perump 100 miles okay and she was like just sent out there with no like they they can't look out the window they can't do that kind of stuff so she came out of that pretty gnarly honest and um and so it, so i i guess i just have confidence in her that she's just that person she is man i've never seen her falter well that's know? that's one of the big things that i've learned uh over time is not making not you got to fucking tell the truth, dude. Yeah. You always got to fucking tell the truth. It always, come, be, it always comes back around if you don't. Yeah, well, I mean, the big thing is, is like, let's take just you guys, for example, right? Is like, if there was something, she shouldn't get to decide what your truth is. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, 100%. Like, you should know the entire truth and get to decide what you do with that truth. Yeah. Not, hey, this is half of what happened. Because you're worried about getting in trouble or right. something like that, I know. You said a bunch of people are starting to hit you up about a uh, relationship stuff, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't know why. I think, uh, um, obviously, Dinah freaking is probably one of the most known girls in super uh, off road and uh, motorcycle racing. But she's been out of it for a game now, for sure. And so she's recently just been asking people like, "Why do you keep following me?" kind of stuff, you know. And uh, a lot of them like our family. Um, I think we do it pretty good. Obviously, all families have problems left and right, but at least the relationship between me and D. We, uh, I, I, I think we have one of the best relationships I've seen out there between a, a husband and wife, <clears throat> mostly because she, we hang out together. Like, you know, a, a guy told me a long time ago, like your friends will come and go, come and go your family, even me, your family will come and go. Right. But your wife will be with you inside of your bed when you die at, at the end of the day. Right. And, uh, I heard that later in life, I went through a bunch of shitty relationships or, you know, I just, I was looking for the hottest chick and getting that stuff. And I had, I had some hot girls, but they're all, they're all freaking, you know, dumb asses or whatever, you know, but with D she's a homie, man. She, uh, yeah, honestly, if I was going to go into a fight, I'd pick her over most guys. <laughs> I think really? she, yeah, fuck yeah, dude. Have you seen this? Have you seen how strong that girl is? No. What? I mean, she's fucking ripped, dude. She's stronger. She, I brought her to, uh, I started bringing her to jujitsu and she rolled through all the girls that were fucking like brown belts and everything. She had to start wrestling the guys. Yeah, she's gnarly, man. She's fucking, she's a, uh, she would have been pro in it. I mean, she obviously plays top three in the Olympia three years in a row. You know, the. Body. I didn't know that. D? No, dude. She was one of the best. Uh, the uh, only thing I know about D is what I've seen throughout like our friendship and stuff and that she was into like supercross and stuff. Dude, she was, before she was in the Supercross, she was the uh, top three in the world. Um, you know, like uh, the Olympia where Arnold Schwarzenegger? Yeah, 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 So she was bikini class, and she was top three in the world three years in a row. 
Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah, she's gnarly, dude. I didn't know that. She did that all by the time she was 20. She's a fucking beast. Yeah, she's a beast, dude. She's a uh, she's a very uh, unique person, dude. All right, so don't fuck with her. Got don't it. fuck with her, dude. <laughs> right, like, I, I, I like her to get in a girl fight one time because I want to see how bad she fucks up that girl, dude. Really? <laughs> yeah, I just think, I, I don't care how good the girl's trained. That girl is just complete athleticism. That'll just fuck anybody up, you know? Damn. But no, the, uh, with her, with her and I, like, uh, well, dude, that's why you guys are a fucking powerhouse. Yeah, that means that means Hunter has got the genetics to do something crazy, you know? <laughs> He'll be pro at something. Damn, yeah, good for you. Knows. But anyways, you know, like with her and I, like we uh, we jive, man. We uh, we freaking, uh, um, you know, I I probably only have a few good friends anymore because it's hard for me to make new friends. Because I compare them to all the friends I had in the teams, yeah. And like, um, when you when you go through miserable situations and things in life, anything in life, right? Uh, through misery is growth, right? When you go that through with other people, you create a bond that's unlike any kind of friendship, right? Agreed. So every time that I meet new friends, I always have a tough time really bonding because I haven't gone through misery with you. So I don't really. How well do I know you? Like I want to, I would like to go through some fucking gnarly misery to see you at your weakest. That way, I really know you, you know. And so it's hard for me to uh, to make really good best friends nowadays because I combine. I always compare them to the friends I had in teams through war, through buds, through just miserable ups and downs situations where I see them at the weekend and their strength. So I can never really duplicate that again, right? Yeah. But I can do that with my wife. <laughs> so like, we go through miserable situations in life where we. Uh, um, we maybe fight, we have kids, we do this kind of stuff. I see her at her weakness and at her strength. So now I know her completely as a person. So she's, she's my new best friend, my new seal best friend, because, um, because I can't du- duplicate that with anybody else. And you, and I'll never be able to, you know, because I'm never going to be in a situation where I'm in a, in a select group going through something miserable ever again, other than with my wife. So so yeah, so that's that's the way I look at her, and um, dude, that's some fucking powerful shit. Well, that's that is it, you know. Like what what it, think about the guys you hang out with now, right? You see them on the good days. Maybe you see them go through a little bit of a bad relationship, or maybe they lost their business. But you're not going with through them with that. Right. So like you're not you're not going through these lows of lows and highs of highs with that person. So you're never really truly going to be as bonded with that person as you are. If you ever went through the military or through war or through your wife, the only person you're going to bond with that with is your wife. So she is your best friend and she's the only person that's going to be by your bed when you die, you know? So why not put all your energy or most of your energy in life into that? I always tell people, you don't know what love is until you have your first child. I think that's the wrong way to look at it. Well, that might be the wrong way to look at it for you, but for me, I didn't know what an unconditional love was until I had my child. And maybe it's different for me than it is for you because Sierra is not the mother of my child, right? And although I had a lot of love for Everly's mother. Okay. Yeah. Okay. She was not my soulmate. Okay. And that's okay. Yes. Right? So maybe it was a difficult time that I was going through to find what love really was. You know, I had lost. Yeah, you're young. You don't know that. You don't, you're not as wise as you are. Right. And like, dude, I had a lot of loss in my life. You know, when I was 17, I found my best friend two minutes after he shot himself in the head. Like everybody that I was around growing up had just died. Yeah. Period. Yes. Right. So I think it was like, dude, and to be honest with you, the first probably year Everly was alive, I didn't have that bond with her. Okay. I, I don't know if you had experienced that at all. But I, I didn't have you, that like you, because you weren't you didn't have a family with you didn't have a family because right. you weren't truly in love with your wife the whatever it is that that freaking dynamic or that chemistry wasn't the same right you know now it's totally different because you do have your soulmate and you do have that kind of thing and you are making a family and you're older and wiser yeah remember I was married twice before Diana I didn't know you were married twice <laughs> yeah really yeah I didn't have any kids with them both but like well, that's I, good. I just, yeah, I just tell, I just tell, I just, I just, I tell Diane all the time because she always brings it up. I'm just like, they're all practice for you, babe. <laughs> but when you're younger, you make bad decisions. You jump into things without a good calculation. You, you know what I'm saying? Like if I, I could have a kid with them, you know, and I probably still would be broken up with them the same way. And then, and like, how, how old are you? 
29. 29. Like, honestly, that's 29, 30, 31 is when I started freaking really starting to figure it out a little bit more. You know, yeah. like, uh, 32, 33, I was like, okay, I'm a fucking idiot. You know, I was doing, I was, you know, as a Navy SEAL, just fucking banging everything. You know, like, I was just, what I didn't understand the fundamentals to make a good family. And I, honestly, Diana says all the time, I wish I would have met you in the teams. Like, no, man, I was, I would have fucked it off, man. Everything you know? happens for a reason, dude. Yeah, everything happens for a reason. And, and it, everything happens when it's supposed to happen. No, but the the reason why I say, if you had to choose between your, your kid or your wife, you choose your wife because you can make another kid and you can love that kid the same, that kind of stuff. But that's the kind of commitment you should have to your wife. And if you have that kind of commitment to your wife, even though that's a, a gnarly question to ask or say or anything, I don't say, I hope that never happens. Right. And I don't want that to happen or right. anything like that. But if you have that mindset towards your wife and that kind of love and commitment, then even though that never happens, that, that will trickle down to your kids. You know what I'm saying? So like, uh, you know, um, you're the leadership of your kids, right? No matter you like it or not, all the things that honestly, the meaning of life, right? You ever, you ever wonder what the meaning of life is? The meaning of life is to go through experience in your life, find your wife, create kin, and then show them love and all the experiences, all the lessons that you've learned in life, teach them so they're a little bit better off in life than you are progress in life. That's, that's the key to life. Right. And, and that's how your name and your, your legacy, your legacy lives on. Right. They, they constantly pick up where you left off and then they pick up and they, those skills that you bring on to your kids, they pass them on to their kids and they pick up where they left off and you, they keep progressing in life. Right. That's, that's the key. That's the key to any organism in life. Right. Is that. And so the, the number one thing for that to do is, is to love your wife and to to show your kid you love your wife and have that commitment to your wife because then they will give that to their wife. If not, they're just going to be setting up franchises with other a bunch of different wives and like have kids all over the place, you know? But those kids are not going to be have any leadership in their life to bring on. I'm not saying that's happening with you. Right. Most people when they have three baby mamas with three year things, they're not they're not they're not given the guidance to that child that they should be because they can't, they, you know, they're, they're pissed peace between three different people, places, you know? Right. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, it, it was hard. A hundred percent. No, I, I know. I'm not saying that's you though. No, I know, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it's not that I have to explain anything, but I, I think I just want to give you a little perspective on, yeah. on what it was, I guess, you know, uh, we tried, Yeah. but at the end of the day, we weren't meant to be to we, with each other. No. You know what I mean? And I think both of us had to sit down at this one point and it was like, okay, what's better for her? Yeah. Is it better for us to stay together and be miserable, miserable. with each other? Yeah. And fight in front of her all the Show time. Her misery, yeah. Or is it better for her for us to split up and be able to show her that, hey, we could still be happy people? Like, dude, we're friends. No, 100%. Like, literally our gender reveal. Yeah. She was she was the only person that was over at our house helping us set up. She set was up. fucking setting up balloon arches, like... Like, dude, it's good. You no, know what I mean? Yeah, no, I'm and, not. I'm not saying it's like it's a bad thing. That's why I guess having a family, and I'm I'm not saying this for you. I'm just saying my mistakes, right? Getting married and have a family before you know yourself, before you have the wisdom to do it, before you have the wisdom to make the decision to make that person or to meet that person and freaking make that wife. That's probably like one of the like most, biggest learning lessons that I've learned. Because I, I remember married twice and I made some fucking bad decisions and I divorced and I wasn't true and I cheated and I was fucking bad. You know, I was a bad fucking husband, you know? I mean, that's and, what they say, right? You can't love somebody else until you love yourself. Yeah, maybe. I I don't know if I... I you're saying I didn't love myself? <laughs> well, I'm saying... I think you're saying that you didn't know yourself. You didn't know... I didn't know. Right? I mean, how, how could you love yourself if you didn't know who you I were? Said, you know, I didn't have wisdom yet. Acceptance, right? Like accepting who you are. And this isn't things that I came to the conclusion from just that. I've also, I observed other people, people that are much more successful than me and their mistakes and they're making, I've seen people that are fucking super wealthy that are, you know, in their fifties and sixties making 20 year old, your mistakes, you know, and their biggest thing is not loving thy wife. Do not, not freaking, uh, you know, 
put having that kind of that that love for her that you'd pick her over anything not having that stuff and you know and and you know some of those wealthy people that you know they'll they'll die and they'll have no legacy to pass it on to and that is my biggest fear is <clears throat> not having a good wife a good family good kids that somehow pick up a little bit better than when I left off because that's the only way people will remember your name I think is picking up where a little bit better than where you left off no like say your son or your daughter um, loves loves you as a dad loves your guidance as a dad picks up where you left off you know what I'm saying progresses you a little bit more and then after 10 20 30 years after you're dead teaching their, their son or their daughter, be like, you know where I learned this from? My dad. My dad taught me how to do this, and this I'm now teaching it to you. That's how you freaking become immortal. You know what's crazy? What? My dad died eight years ago. There's one of the biggest lessons I've ever had in life. It was given to me from my dad. What? Never give up, man. Never give up. It, it, was, he, was he a good dad? Yeah, dude, he's great. See? And that's and that's that's the key. Did is, was he married to your mom to the end? Uh, no, she uh, she decided to divorce him about a year before he passed away. So, but, but through your childhood, yeah, really, what? Right at the end, she divorced him, Mike. Well, dude, I mean, he died of a heart attack. So, uh, like, how old was he? He was sixty four. But you had together parents. Um, you throughout you, my childhood, but it was weird, bro. Like it was it. Was, See, dude, I think that like fucked me up for a long time too because it was a weird fucking relationship. Like, and as a kid, it was just the normal to me. I didn't understand it, right? Like, it was just like, oh, dad sleeps on the couch, mom sleeps in the bed. Oh shit! I never saw my dad sleep in the bed with her ever. Oh man, that's ever. That's another key rule that I always have for people too: always sleep in the same bed. Yeah, always bang and always sleep in the same bed. (laughs) I never saw my parents sleep in the same bed ever. Did they kiss and make out? Never saw it. Jesus. Well, don't do that. Yeah, no, 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 dude, and I get it. And, like, I came, I would come home, my dad would be in one room, my mom would be in another. I yeah. never saw them being intimate. I never saw them being loving on each other. I never, ever saw any of that shit, dude. Ever. Oh, man, that sucks. It's crazy, right? You got to do that, though. No, no, no. I know, dude. Trust me. You got to slap and, her ass in the oh, morning. Bro. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sierra's like, get the fuck off me. Dude. Yeah, yeah. Like, literally, and maybe that's why, is like, yeah. dude, the second I come, from the second I get home, I'm all over her. Yeah. I'm like, hey, like, I want your, I want your attention. I want your love. I want Your kids are seeing that and feeling yeah, that, you know? Yeah. And like, and, uh, dude, like, my big thing is, like, I have a daughter, right? Now I got a boy on the way. I'm fucking yeah. ready for that shit. But, <laughs> like, I have a daughter. Like, I want to show her what she deserves. What she, yeah, she deserves a man that loves everything. Every single fucking inch of her, hundred percent. Every everything. Yes. Her her bad days, her good days, her her faults, her her, you know her her stuff that she's not proud of. They they're gonna want to want to see how you treat your wife when you get in a fight too. Like yeah, how dude. you show them, like how you freaking get maybe pissed off. You guys walk away, or if you come here and just slap the shit out of your wife. You know, I would never do that. I'm just saying, but they're watching that. Yeah. They're watching that, and that's what they're going to do when they get older. It's key, dude. It's and key. You know what's funny? Like, I had anger problems back in the day, dude. Like, when I was in high school or whatever, there's fucking holes all over my house. You don't seem angry at all. Dude, I'm so calm now. So crazy. <laughs> I had, like, really bad, really bad anger problems when I was in high school. Why do you think that is? I was bullied. Really? Yeah. And well, it's, it's not it, that dude, bad, dude. And it's crazy. Like, it, it ran in my family. Like, we had bad fucking tempers. But, like, throughout my entire fucking high school era junior high whatever our house all of the walls i was getting in fights all the time i got jumped like i told you numerous yeah. fucking times um but I, I would just get so pissed off and i just couldn't control my temper and i would just start breaking shit everywhere and uh i don't know what that really has to do with anything but <laughs> i you know like now i'm i'm very calm i i will still get senses of that temper when me and Sierra will get in arguments, and sometimes it has happened in front of Everly, and I'm like, "Hey, we can't do this right hey, now." Honestly, you're you're one of the motivated, most motivated people I've met in a long time. You're fucking motivated, dude. Really? Yeah, man. I was awesome. talking to Diane about it today. I was like, "Dude, damn, I was fucking motivated, man." Dude, you want to know what, man? Uh, 
you know, you've been through a lot of hard shit in your life, a lot yeah. of crazy shit in your life. Yeah. You know what I mean? I've seen what my life, I have an understanding of what my life is. Yeah. I have an understanding, a very clear understanding of the fact that my life could not exist tomorrow. I know that everything could be taken away from me in the, the blink second. of an eye. Yeah. Including my family, the closest people around me, because it's happened to me. Yeah. I've lost the closest people to me. And you see it at a young age. Yeah. 100%. At a young age. Yeah. Okay. It was very hard. I, I don't I don't know what kind of PTSD you have dealt with throughout PT- your PTSD is what pays us. I mean PTSD. That's what I said. PTSD. Oh, PTSD. And I just fucking wait. What? <laughs> what the fuck did you just say? <laughs> PSD is what uh, what pays us in the military. PTSD is what. No, I said PTSD. Oh, PTSD. Okay, I don't know what kind of PTSD you have from the military. If you have any, some people do, some people don't. Yeah. I don't necessarily have PTSD, but I I have a very clear understanding that even though we're having this conversation, yeah, I can never talk to you again. What do you mean? You oh, could, you'd be, dude, like I could. We drive. could fuck. You can leave here and die. I'm gonna drive home after drinking these shots. And, and I've, dude, I've, <laughs> just, I'm being legit, bro. Yeah, I've know, dealt with that shit. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I've, like, I've, I've talked to one of my closest friends. Like, hey, bro, I love you. I'll see you tomorrow. And then I never get to see you tomorrow. Yeah, you, can, you know what I mean. Life can end in a second. Like my dad, dude. I, I still have a very clear picture of, of talking to my dad for the last time when he walked in my room asking me to hang out with him. Because he died at 65. You said 64. Right? 64. That's yeah. young. I was 21 years old, dude. Yeah. And Fuck. my parents had just got divorced a year before that. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, my brother lived in Kansas. So it was just me and my dad. Yeah. Like, dude, that was my best fucking friend. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, it, it, dude, like my best friend when I was 17 years old. Seventeen is fucking young, dude. That's young, yeah. I, first, I literally to, found my be- my best friend, my yeah, brother. To be your first uh, kind of snapshot of uh, life and death at seventeen is pretty young, man. Dude, I mean, some gory shit. Uh, two minutes after he shot himself in the head, I heard him shoot himself. I was with him three hours earlier. Fuck what? I was with him three hours earlier, playing fucking Call of Duty in his. Why, in his, did, he, why did he do that? Because he was dude, he was depressed and he didn't fucking talk about it. And and his girl, wonder, his girl, and and dude, here's the thing. I had a podcast with my good friend Iman, right? Yeah. He 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 tried to commit suicide. He shot himself in the head, and he lived. Okay. I don't understand suicide. Okay, I don't so, understand it. So, it, it's it's dark thoughts that just come over you very quickly. It, it's a, it's a very quick thing. It's a very selfish thing to do, though. I understand that. Yeah, I understand that. But during that time, you're not thinking about that stuff, dude. You have these dark thoughts that come into your head, and they just take over. I was suicidal. I had a gun in my mouth at one point. But why do that? I don't because, understand. Because, you, okay, so don't think about an elephant. What would you just think about? An elephant. Right. Okay, so when you have all these fucking dark thoughts in your head, you can't just not think about it. Can't you just go for a walk? Yeah, you could. My thing is, is I go to sleep. You, you can't you can't sit here at this table and tell me you don't have dark thoughts. You don't have depressing thoughts like, I do. fuck, yeah, everybody like, does. Yeah, it's human through, nature. But I, I also know that every hard time has an up time. Agreed. Everything's ups and downs, right? But when you're in that hard time, what are you thinking about? I think, I, I think I'm thankful for it. Yep. Because hard times create more character, and that's when I learn my lessons. Yep. So I, I, the deeper I go into hard times, I'm like, fuck yeah, now it's go time. Okay, so now, so now you're understanding what this podcast is about. What? Overcoming life struggles, bro. Like, okay, oh. so so listen to me. So the the one motto that I live by. That's why it's called bad beat. Bad I get beat. it. You get it. Oh, now. Why didn't you tell me this before, <laughs> dude? So listen to me. My motto, my motto in life is everything happens for a reason. Yeah, dude, everything happens for a reason. I, I live my life by that motto, right? Yeah. Crashing my fucking car the other week, whatever it was, uh, losing my best friend, losing all my other friends, losing my dad, all that shit. It had to happen. It had to happen to get me to where I am today. 100%. Okay? And when you can start and to if it look... it didn't happen, you probably wouldn't be here where you are. I, I wouldn't. No. There's no fucking way I would. No. I'm right here because of every single micro decision that has ever been made or every micro instance that has happened in my life put me right here at this chair in this in this room right now. They say, you know what they say, like, uh, there's no sunny sunny day team guys. What is I it? Mean, sunny day, t- there's no sunny day seals. So I'm saying. There's no <clears throat> seals or 
team guys are built through misery, right? Right. Strongest force that we have in the military. They're built through misery, right? So that means there's no sunny day seal. Like you're, you ain't going to build a seal from sunny days. So if you're, if you think, I don't want it to be a seal podcast, but like, this is what I've learned. You won't, the, the most lethal force in our military is built through misery, right? So the, the more miserable your times are, the only better you're going to be. Yep. That's what I think. Uh, dude, I, I fucking, a hundred, I'm getting chills, bro. I 110% agree with you. So, so what I think nowadays, when you say you have those dark thoughts, do you think of those things? I think like, fuck yeah, this is where I learn. This is where I progress. This is the most miserable it is living this misery, accept it, fucking go through it, fight through it. And fucking all of a sudden you come out more wisdom and a little bit sharper. That's right. I do think I, I think that, and I, t- Diana is like, she gets, she gets, when we get in miserable times, right? <clears throat> like say, you know, we, cause we know, all do. Yeah. Like we lost, uh, like she lost 154,000, uh, dollars this year from, uh, uh, scam scam right yeah and then we um we have another thing that's popping up we're probably gonna lose like somewhere between four hundred and four five hundred thousand this year right it's okay we're good to go right yeah but we're gonna learn from those mistakes and we'll be a little bit sharper each time it's not gonna put us under we're gonna only be a little bit better you know the base family's doing good <laughs> no matter how bad it is right because the ammo kind of dumped we spent a lot of money on that but we came back up from it we're good to go but it is miserable for a little bit but like there was a miserable time when we had the bars. We went fucking some gnarly shit through that. We got a little smarter, did a little better. So it doesn't matter how bad it gets. It's only going to get better after that. Yep. That's what I think. And then maybe maybe you get hit by three or four miserable times. That means you're going to have like three or four high times coming out of it. That's what I honestly think. Yeah, dude. That's why I don't, I don't, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be in genuine or anything like that. So I don't understand um, suicide because you're just cutting yourself short because you're just, Cutting yourself before you have the good times. Yeah, you know, <sighs> dude. That's what I. That's what I think. I mean, I, maybe it's maybe it's different. Maybe, but also maybe I don't. I might be my. I've never had the chemistry where my brain's off a little bit or something like that. But I just, I just think you're cutting yourself short because you're, you're robbing yourself of the, all the good times. Yeah, I, what, dude, I, I, I agree with you, man. Trust me, I, I, I really do. So if you if you ever go through a time where you got to get in, just call me up. I'll tell you about I will, worst times. I, I, oh I, I will tell you right now. I will never be in a position like that ever again. Ever again, because I have a clear understanding. You yeah. know what I mean? I, dude, you got to realize I was 21 years old, and Everly's mother. I was dating her at the time. Yeah. So, I'd lost all my friends. Yeah. I just lost my dad. My mom wasn't talking to me. Yeah, you lost your family. Didn't talk to my brother. Family. And at that, during that time, me and Faith broke up. Yeah. So I'm sleeping in the room where my dad died by myself, nobody to talk to. Just I was just miserable, bro. But you know, I, but also the same. If I've never been in that situation, I've never lost every like say I lost my family or right? something like that. I'd be in a deep hole. Okay, so so let's put that in perspective. Yes. Tomorrow so, you you lose Diana, Hunter, Penny. Yes, and that's what you're talking about. Yeah, dude. That would be a fucking gnarly situation. It's a gnarly situation, and I've been through it. And, you know, you, you think about these things in time to time, and I, what I would think about, I was like, I've got to live on because I'm the only legacy left. I would tell him that, you know, even how miserable it is, I'd so, be like, i got to live on. It's a lot easier said than done, brother. Yeah, but uh, fucking misery. How, how, do you, how do you look at the upside to that? I mean, you've got to fucking just push. Look, man. I, the only thing that got me through all of that shit was taking it day by day. Day by day. Yeah. It's the only thing you can do. I, I couldn't look at all of the, 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 the hard shit that I had to deal with, the, the, the obstacles that I had to overcome. I had to look at, okay, what can I do today? And for a while I fucked off, dude. I had fun. I partied, whatever. Yeah, just numbing it. Yeah, I was just numbing the pain. Yeah. And, you know, I ended up getting back with Faith, and and I think that was a really good thing for me. Had I not done that, I probably wouldn't be here, dude, because, you know, I was able to go into her family. Yeah. And be around, you know, I mean, her dad kind of became La- a father figure for me. Lashing on anything for me. can to like, right, well, dude. yeah, 100%. And it's like, you know, Iman. Lifeboats. Lifeboat. Yeah, dude. Yeah, <laughs> lifeboats. Yeah, dude. Yeah, Fuck yeah. yeah. So it's like, you know, Iman came on here, and he legitimately shot himself in the head. And woke up thirty minutes, thirty-seven minutes after he shot himself. He should have bled out. Yeah, maybe I mean, he lost his eye, everything. 
just and a, it's just an eye. He's fine. Yeah, no, no, he, no, no. And dude, he's he's a, he's a great guy. Yeah, yeah. I, I love him to death, dude. And you know, the one thing he talks about, he's like, dude, I like now I have more purpose than ever. Yeah, because now I now I want to help people that have that are that are going through these hardships, and I want to help. That like, dude, that. like I fucking did that. I would never do that again. Please do not end up in the position that I'm in. Well, sometimes like the loss of purpose also brings you down. If you feel like you have no purpose, what's good of me? So, you know, it, it's funny that you say that because I feel like a lot of military guys, um, because, I 100%. mean, a, a lot of military guys commit suicide. And but I the, feel like they is, do that because of the loss of purpose. No, I think, this is my theory on it, right? You know more than it's I do. Theory. So, you come out of a, a fraternity, a badass fraternity, right? Whether, anything you're in the military, you're in a fraternity, right? You're going, you're training, you have purpose, you're doing this stuff. Going down range, you're you're freaking uh, coming up with a uh, solution to the problem. Doing that, all of a sudden you're out, and you have to restart again, right? Restarting sucks. I, sometimes I actually think restarts sometimes are awesome because you know you're taking all the stuff that you learned, but they don't think like that. They're thinking like, okay, so they say. I think I feel like PTSD in the military is misused a lot. You know, it's like, why do you have PTSD because a traumatic situation. Like, say, like, you're in a situation where you're a bunch of uh, your friends died and you're, you're fucking just dealing with that, right? But, like, I feel like guys are getting PTSD from that never been in combat or anything like that, right? They're getting PTSD from just being in and now getting out. I mean, it's getting thrown around a lot, I think. Yeah. You know, and I, I think that's why. I think they, they're they used to a situation in the military that was, that was spoon-fed to them, very easy, Get, get camaraderie, get friends. You're stuck in this little bubble. Now you're out in the real world and you have to reinvent yourself again. And they can't deal with that. <clears throat> I'm not saying it's a bad thing or a good thing. I don't know. Hopefully this has come off as bad. I, like, I just, I don't know. I just, I don't like that. Okay, th- think about me. I've been in combat shitloads. Fucking bad things, good things. You know, do you have any PTSD from any of that? Uh, I think I think the closest stuff was me is like uh, I don't know I don't sleep very good, you know I I'm, but I'm super hyper aware all the time. Maybe that's from it. I don't know. Um, definitely when I came back from the from combat deployments, I'm I'm like a caged animal about ready to wreck everybody. Definitely a lot of bar fights, that kind of stuff. Um, is it? Do you think it's because people like? You're so used to this mentality of people are trying to hurt you. I think that the that war makes you super aware, and it clicks on a part in your brain that makes you super aware. You know what I'm saying? Uh, especially combat. High combat makes you super aware, and it's hard to shut that off. I think. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not an expert on it. You know, so I don't want to seem like an expert. And uh, you're a lot more of an expert than anybody else I've talked to. Yeah, because like you know, if like like I, I'm a light sleeper now, I can. You know, if I get a solid four hours a night, I'm good. Mixed really? sleep. Yeah, I don't sleep much. Damn. Yeah, I don't, I don't, and I've never, I have never have, I, I noticed it like uh, my last combat um, deployment. I just uh, sort of sleeping less and less. I toss and turn a lot. I don't know if that's from my, I've talked to different people about it, and it's like they say that your brain um, turns on to super aware um, and it's hard to turn it off. You know, and a lot of guys, I think, turn to alcohol and make themselves numb, that kind of stuff, which we're drinking freaking proper 12. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's man. okay. We're, dr- we're drinking. Oh, have PTSD. No, <laughs> dude, we're drinking and enjoying ourselves. Hey, look, no, man, you always have time for a beer <laughs> yeah. with a buddy. Yeah, no. All right? No, I think, uh, I don't I don't know. I don't know what the complete answer to PTSD is. I think that sometimes the guys that use it that were never in hardcore combat, um, I think they're maybe just using it to get an extra buck or something like that. I don't like that kind of stuff. Right. Um, I don't like it when the, the the log suit guy that was on base never left the wire. But at the same time, maybe he came into the military not thinking he was going to get into anything bad, and all of a sudden mortars are dropping on him. Who knows? I don't know. Right. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the uh, right answer is to that, but uh, – I, I don't like it when guys kill themselves for it. That's pretty nuts. I don't think, I think sometimes they're not killing themselves because PTSD. I think they're killing themselves because they can't cope with 
a change in life. Right. And that's what, that, that's kind of what I was saying. Right. It's like, you know, when I, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I feel that these guys in the military have so much purpose when they're in there. Okay. You have so much purpose. You're in this brotherhood. You, you're, you're this fucking Very warrior. Sim- simple life. Right. Very simple life. Yeah. And it's, it's all, you know, and yes. then you get out to civilization and you just feel that loss of purpose. And then it's probably the same thing that I say. It's hard for them to make new friends, you know, with, uh, you know, they don't see the highs and lows and they don't get that brotherhood anymore. Um, and maybe and they I, have maybe combined with a bad relationship, you know, maybe that's it. Maybe I mean, it's a combination of that. I could see that dude, like not being able to bond with somebody like that, you know, have well, that bonding with a brother if or you're not, a if wife. You're not, if you're not in a, like an organized sport anymore, you're not, you're not in like, uh, um, like something that brings you together because organized sports are pretty good too because you're going through some kind of battle with your organized sports stuff like but when you get out of high school or college you don't have that anymore too so how do you how do you bond with dudes or how do you bond with anybody unless you find a badass bitch you know what do you think uh what do you think like a huge key factor of you having Diana be that person for you is like is it just like just you guys being just radically open with each other or like, I mean, I know, I know the honesty was a huge thing, but like, I feel like a lot of people are honest to a point. Yeah. Not her. You know what I mean? Like she's taught me how to be honest. (laughs) Like, like dude. And the reason I love Sean Whalen and all of his shit so much is because that dude is so fucking open and honest with the people that he talks to. Sean Whalen. Sean Whalen, the lion's den. The, Oh, okay, okay. That book. Which you should take a copy. Lines, you lines in the uh, sheep. Yep, yep. Okay. Lines on sheep. His, his thing is like, he he is fucking him his whole self, dude. Like everybody has. Okay, so I tested to be a metro police officer yeah. right before I was starting my business. At the same time, I was starting my business actually. Okay. One of the questions on the questionnaire was, "Have you ever thought about having sexual intercourse with an animal?" <laughs> what? And I was like, "What the fuck? What kind of animal?" <laughs> but dude like i was like <laughs> i was like i was like what the fuck do people actually think about this shit and then i mean obviously i said no well, now that whatever. you're bringing it up now i'm thinking about right it. Dude, okay yeah but like here's the here's here's the here's the thing right is like people have these weird fucking thoughts that pop in our heads all day long like Dude, like, it's dumb. It, it might be some completely dumb shit, right? Yeah. But nobody will ever admit it to anybody. No, sometimes sometimes when I work out, I actually think that, like, uh, <laughs> bad guy's tracking down my family to kill them, and I have to catch them on the okay. treadmill. And that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> that's Dude, that's okay. That's your motivating, right? Yeah. Whatever. I fucking run so fast. <laughs> <laughs> like, dude, like, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not judging anything. That, that's, a, that's a big key thing of, like, me learning not to judge people. Is because we're all human. We all think weird fucking shit. Yeah. But 90% of the people aren't willing to be open and admit that. Gotcha. Right? Yeah. So it's like, what, like, like, be, like being 100% open and 100% truthful, not only with yourself, but with a spouse. Yeah, it's hard. Like, honestly, uh, she had to lead me out of that. So she, uh, what when, do you mean? When she first met me, I was just dirtbag, dude. Like, uh, I used to lie and fucking cheat and uh, lie to girls nonstop. Like, like I had to like do a lot of stuff. And she used to call me out. She's like, "Why are you lying? I won't get mad at you. Just tell me the truth." Yep. And it like took this like long time to fucking honestly. She she's my savior a lot in this, in, in life about that stuff. And like, uh, she taught me that it's okay to tell the truth. And uh, <laughs> like I. I, especially to girls, I used to lie all the time, you know, I just try to bang girls and lift them up and right different places. And, uh, I'm a good talker, you know, so I could always pull them in and just try to work that situation and, and just hang out with the bros, bros before hoes, that kind of thing. But that's also like still team life, you know? Right. And, um, and she had to teach me that wasn't the way. And, uh, so when I say like being family and all that stuff, it was, she was honestly my leader out of that kind of stuff. And it's, and you know, a lot of, a lot of, we lie a lot, I think because we're about getting in trouble because we're not going to get accepted, that kind of stuff. You know, I think. Yeah. I mean, we're afraid of 
judgment or judgment or that kind of stuff. And she's, she doesn't, she just says, no, it's okay. Like, just tell me. And I tell her and she doesn't, she's like, it's all right. Thank you for being honest. And I'm like, fuck, that's it. All right. right. Cool, man. And so it's, uh, it's a better way to be. It's very, it's a big leap to be like that, you know, and it's scary, especially if you are a liar, you know? Um, and, uh, I think, that's probably one of the biggest problems, I guess, with the relationships. I, I I would assume is leading double life, lying, doing this kind of stuff, like trying to manage both sides. I think I don't know. Well, dude, not only that, it's like you can't be your true self, right? No, because yeah. like situations will pop up, and like, dude, I've lied in relationships. I've I've one hundred percent. Everybody has, yeah. right? And it's like you you will pop into these situations, and something will come up and you can't be your true self because you have this thought pop in your head or this weight on your shoulder kind of holding you back. Right. Yes. Like whether it be in the bedroom it's exhausting or it's exhausting too. Fuck yeah. It's exhausting, Fucking dude. Exhausting, like, dude. like, Oh shit. I hope he doesn't find out about this or Oh shit. Like I, yeah. need to, I need to drag this person away from the situation because I don't want them to find out. It's like, dude, fuck, just be open, dude. And fucking tell him. It was hard too, because D D was so honest it was hard for me to adapt because I thought she was doing it to be like, I thought she was lying to be, she was so honest. It was hard for me to understand because I've never met an honest person before. Like yeah. even team guys, we're not honest, man. <laughs> we're fucking, no, I mean, we're honest to each other, but like, no, not in relationships. Honestly, most team guys are not honest in relationships, man. <laughs> like, cause we're bros before hoes. We just yeah. live that fucking word of life. So like, uh, it was hard for me cause I never met a girl that's super honest like that. And then that would call me on my shit. And so I was just like trying to adapt to it. I'm like, fuck, she have an angle on this? What's her angle? And she's just not. She's just fucking be like, no, be honest. It's fine. Did you have a hard time adapting after you got out of the service? <sighs> Let me think. Like living a normal life, not living in war. I mean... I don't think so. I think that uh, not living in war. I mean, I came out. I came out. Par- I mean, I came out still fighting. I got in like the biggest uh, contractor um, anti piracy attack in history. Civilians. Oh shit! Yeah, I smoked like eighteen dudes <laughs> come on these ships, and the freaking they hit us on off Squatra, this island. So I was like, I was so I came, so my introduction to normal life, I was. Going into Malta, buying arms from an arms dealer in Malta, right? And then bringing them on a ship, going through the Suez Canal, picking up my three friends to Port Suez, going down the Red Sea, going down the Gulf of Aden, getting in a piracy attack, fucking maybe firing out with them, getting paid a thousand bucks a day, then jumping off in South Africa and hooking up with chicks, taking a couple of days off and doing it again. So that was my introduction to normal life. And I was like, fuck, normal life's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not really like, but I'm, I'm saying like that the normal life that you have now. Like, like not having to protect 24 seven, not have to think about going in like piracy and, 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 you know, in Afghanistan and all that shit. Like, was it, was it a hard change for you going from being this, and I'm not saying that you're not, but being this warrior 24 fucking seven that you're just in fight mode yeah, to being that family man. I would, I would say, I don't want to be, I don't want to be lying here, but I would say it'd be hard if I didn't get with like a fucking dime, dude. Then she's got the, I got, so I come off that and now I've got this chick that's this blonde hot chick with a huge fucking ass. Like Diane is like <laughs> a black girl trucker in a white girl's body. That's why I always say I'm like, dude, she's thick like a black girl, but in a white girl's body. Right? Yeah. And I, I come from that into this and I'm like, fuck, this is good too, man. So I haven't got to actually <laughs> slow down yet. We've we've touched base on a lot of different things. We've touched base on family. We've touched base on you know you becoming a seal. Uh, we've touched base on you getting out of the service and and becoming this amazing family man. Um, but you know one thing I wanted to dive into was actually being in war. War. Okay. So as a, as a, as a civilian, you know, in, in everyday Joe, you could put it whatever it is. And I could speak for a lot of people because I've talked to a lot of people. I don't think we get a lot of opportunities to ask somebody like yourself what it's really like being in war. You know, like what it, what what is it like 
having to deal with those circumstances that you had to deal with or, you know, being put in these situations, whether you like it or not. I mean, and like the feelings that you've had, the the situations that you've been put in. I mean, I think so just life and death and war, right? Dealing with like gnarly life and death and war and that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. Whether you're smoking a dude or you're freaking watching somebody smoke a dude or something like that, right? Um, the thing that I think is different from us or and again i never had to watch a buddy die i'm lucky for that a lot of team guys had to yeah. but as far as like going out wanting to smoke somebody or or going down range and the opportunity of smoking somebody or that kind of stuff we are trained so much and we want it so much when the opportunity arises you're you're ready for that what do you mean you want it so much you want to be in combat. You want to be in that stuff because you're, you're training like. It's all you know, you know at that time. 18 months. You're training. We're a direct action force, DA, direct action, capture, kill. That is what the mission set of a SEAL is, DA, direct action. All right. It's not FID where it's um, Green Berets or SF that train the populace to do this or say you're a medic as a PJ or you're a uh, combat controller with the Air Force or or anything like that. Our main focus is DA, direct action, capture kill, right? So whether a kill house or you're you're patrolling into freaking, uh, you're doing land warfare or you're doing any um, any mobility or anything, it all comes down to that. So by the time you get into war and you're actually running and gunning and doing that stuff, you're fucking like a caged dog. You want you want that. You want that thing. You want to show your skills. You want to do that stuff now. When it actually happens, you know, some people deal with it left or right, whatever you do. Most most team guys, I feel like, are ready to do it again. Let's do it. Come on. That's our mission set is, uh, is that you're, so you're trained to do. That's what you've gone into the teams to do. I think it's a very small percentage of team guys that get into and be like, oh, this is too much. You know, I, I don't think that exists too often. I don't know nowadays, but I know in my day you're, you're with your homies you're fucking lions. You're ready to crush people. You're ready to fucking take it to the enemy. So when it arises and it comes down to that, um, I don't. People don't really think any differently. They don't second guess themselves. They're ready right. for that. And that's because what we're, we're trying to do, you know. Um, and uh, have you ever been put in that position where it's like, fuck, should I do this? No, no. I mean, fuck, should I do this or fuck, should I fucking no? Because you're Say if you're a fighter and you're you're trained to get into a fucking ring your whole life, and then the fight happens, you, most fighters are like fucking bring it to them, right? That's what team guys are. So um, me, when I was in that situation, I was I was ready to go. Let's do it. Let's capitalize. Let's crush it. Let's keep moving. Boom. Be aggressive. Fucking straight line, straight line movements. Dominate. Fucking crush. Keep moving. You know, and uh, you're like a you're like a working dog or a pit bull ready to go. So me myself, I, I never thought twice of combat or, or being in a situation where that could happen or did happen. Um, I'm ready to do it and freaking make it home, you know. And like, I, I think I was more talking about like collateral. Collateral. What do you mean? Like somebody being in the way of you and your enemy. I mean, like if you're in a firefight and people are out there hanging around, families or. Oh, I'm. I don't know. I've never. I've never had to deal with like, you, like say you had to smoke a family to get the enemy. Yeah, or some. I, I mean, I don't know, dude. Like, I mean, I don't. I, I've never been in that situation, but um, usually when the bullets are flying and uh, and you're f- taken to the enemy, most people that are innocent are probably not outside, you know, strolling the streets. It's you true. know, you know what I'm saying. Um, but again. You know, I'm not speaking anything that I know, but I'm sure there's situations where it's war, you know? Like, I mean, if if you if you fought a war in America, I'm sure collateral damage does ha- will happen, you know? It's just it's the way it is, but, like, what do you do with that, you know? Are you going to fucking feel sorry about that? Would you not go? I don't know. I, I wouldn't. Uh, I got to think about this real quick. Have you had sleepless nights because of... Collateral damage? Not 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 just collateral damage, but like, have, I mean, have you like, does that shit replay in your head? 
Like, like um, okay, so l- let me give you an example. So we talked about when I was 17, I found my best friend two minutes after he shot himself, right? Yeah. yeah. I couldn't walk in the dark alone for six months. Every time I was in a dark room, I saw my best friend covered in blood. That was, and, you know, we talked about PTSD and, and how, you know, you might not see it as it is what it is. And I don't know that that was PTSD or whatever it was, but I was a kid. And all I could see in the dark was my best friend covered in blood with his lifeless body. Right? So that caused me to not be able to be in a dark room. It caused a lot of sleepless nights. I'm asking, did you have a hard time seeing this war that you were involved in? And, and, and like, how did it affect you? And, like, how do you think it affected other people? The difference is between that and, like, what I experienced in life, right? So you were thrown into that without any kind of training or any kind of foresight that you were going to get into that, right? And that's why I think a lot of guys that have PTSD are just normal military guys that got thrown into a convoy, then everybody got blown up, right? Right. And so you, you had that experience without any kind of training or any kind of foresight of what's to come. You were just living your daily life. All of a sudden, somebody got smoked. You saw it. And you're like, what the fuck? I wasn't ready for that. You yeah. know? Me. How do they train you for that, though? What? How do they train you to be around? Okay, think about this. Say if, like, say if you, uh, I don't know. How do they train you to be in, like, like, how do they train you to kill? How do they train, and not only, like, I understand the training to kill, but how do they train you to be okay with killing? How do they train you to be around deceased people? I don't think I don't think they it's 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 training for an objective, right? You train yourself in your mind mm. to be ready for that. Gotcha. Right. So say like if if for two years prior to your friend getting smoked, you dealt with people shooting themselves in their head and how to how to stitch them up, right? You saw Maybe did a pig lab where you shot pigs in the head and then you fucking try to save the pigs because we do big pig labs and stuff. You know, what I, we I did not know that. Well, you shoot pigs up and then you try to save the pigs. They're called pig labs. Really? Yeah, hundred percent. So that was part of your training. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. You would you would go to a, a a field of pigs. Yeah. You'd shoot them and then try to save them. Yeah. It's wow. Pig, pig labs. They're awesome. I, I had no idea. Yeah, That's because crazy. Pigs have the same size organs as a human. Wow. So dude, I used to, there was one we shot up and I broke the chest open, re, re-pumped the heart, got the heart to pump again. It's pretty cool. Wow. So anyways, so say for a year, two years prior to your friend shooting himself, he did pig labs where you shot up some pigs, did this stuff, and then maybe maybe you freaking uh, um, did targets where you had targets shooting themselves and that kind of stuff. By the time your friend shot yourself himself, you'd be ready for that. Does that make sense? So he'd be like, boom, okay, yeah, this is what happens. His head shot off. He's like, fucking this. He's bleeding out through his neck, this kind of stuff. Yeah. Same thing. Okay, it's, 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 it's a familiar space. It's, you're desensitized by the gotcha. time you get to there. Okay. So, does that make sense? Yep. So it's, it's not that. So uh, they desensitize you. I don't think they desensitize you. They, they prep you for what's to come. It's not desensitizing. They're prepping you. But was there things that you weren't prepped for? They I can't mean, prep you for watching a convoy blow up. I, I think that I think preparation with with um, through the enthusiasm gets you through those times. Does that make sense? So I don't think I don't think it's a yeah. But hey, you know what? No, it's not rainbows and butterflies. Right. You know, the shit sucks. But I mean, but again, you got to think of the person that's coming into that. You have a guy that is physically. And mentally fucking strong. You know, you don't, you're not, you're not dealing with a guy that's fucking playing video games on the side, eating right. Doritos, a little fatty. You know what I'm saying? You're dealing, you're already dealing with a motivated person ready to be in that situation, a highly intellectual, fucking aggressive. So when that comes, you're freaking, you're dealing with it. You know, you're, you're you, you have a mentally tough person dealing with that. You don't have a mentally weak person. So it's not, it's not the same. It's hard to talk about like, a person going through a hard time in, you know, in, in life, but not, or an alpha ready to fight war, prepared to fight war, seeing all the things that are bad, 
ready to do the, the mission at set and then dealing with the, the problems, working the problem, taking care of it, it's very it's different. You know what I'm saying? It's it's apples and oranges, if that right. makes sense. Yeah, no, no, it does. So for me, um, not anymore. I'm, a, I'm more of a, a soft guy now. You know, I've got a daughter. I tickle her all the time, that kind of stuff. But me back then, I was a hard guy. I was ready to go. And my friends were hard. And, and so when bad situations happened, um, we – crushed them and and kept fucking moving you know and and i'm just happy my friends are all home and so win six or uh, uh mission success yeah, <laughs> that yeah. makes sense so i'm happy what, you're home man i'm home now so it's good to go so um, and remember that's not me anymore now i'm like i like to sleep in my nice bed my tempur bed get my steam room do i wake up in the morning Come out of a tepropedic bed. I start my steam room. Start Yo, you coffee. got the most legit steam room I think I've ever been in. You been? In, have you been? You been in the steam room at Lifetime, bro? This dude's steam room shits on it. So like, I wake up in the morning. I get out of my tepropedic. Hey, what's your morning routine? Okay, I wake up in the morning. I at about six five thirty six o'clock. I wake up, start my coffee machine, which my things all set up. I go. I start my steam room at the same time, right? As my steam warm steam room is warming up, I'm drinking my coffee. I st- I do my shit in my fucking Toto toilet inside my <laughs> toilet room. <laughs> the same, it's got a heated seat. It's got it's it's got after you're done, it sprances you, air dries you, and deodorizes you. I it deodorizes you? Yeah, I got It's got essential. You don't oils. even got a wipe? No, it it sprays you. Oh, you got a bidet. It's a Toto. You want know a Toto toilet? Yeah, I know, I've, dude. Unfortunately, I've installed a shit ton of them. I, I just, I haven't gotten one yet. Oh, dude, it's it's a life changer. So, like, <laughs> it freaking, it, it, you, you shit, and then it sprays you, and then this air dryer comes out, air dries you, and then it sprances you with essential oils underneath. And then after that, I fucking go to my steam room, I soak my steam room, and then I take a cold shower to cool me down for my steam room, and I get ready for the day. How often do you do the cold plunge? Uh, every morning. You do that, too? Yeah, I do that, too. When do you do that? Before right the steam room? Right after I wake up. Oh, so you jump in the the cold plunge, and then you go... And then I start my routine. Gotcha. Just for 30 seconds. Quick 30-second. Oh, that's it? Yeah. Dude, you made me sit in that thing for like six fucking minutes. I do that at night. (laughs) I do that at night. (laughs) Dude, I've never been in a... Have you ever been in a cold plunge? Dude, I've never been in a cold plunge. We go over to his house. He makes me sit in this thing for like six fucking minutes. (laughs) It was cold. It was cold. I keep it at 34 (laughs) degrees. (laughs) It was cool, man. I, mean, I want you know why? Because I wanted to be friends with him, and I wanted to see him misery, so to make sure I knew him. Dude, you want to know? What? Hey, let me let me be uh, let me be let me be open and honest with you, dude. Uh, you know, ever since you said that, I, I've I've honestly really been like subconsciously thinking, like, man, almost like I feel for you because I understand, you know, in in a different way, right? By making and, friends. Yeah. I understand how it's hard to find new friends, but the th- the thing that I want to, I guess, express to you, yeah. and not to say I'm in any place to give you advice, right? Yeah. You have a lot more life experience than I do, yeah. but not everybody needs to be your best friend. No, I, I agree. You know what I mean? And it's like, it's okay to have friends. It's okay to have acquaintances. And I think there is a huge line between Friends and acquaintances. Acquaintance, you see at a party, hey, how you doing? You know, you see at an event, hey, how's you know, how's, you gotta, how's fucking Tom? Like, but but you have to be careful. Who knows? You, I might like to fuck goats. Dude, that's okay. <laughs> that hey, that was that was a question on the fucking LVMPD, <laughs> no, hey, dude. And it's that's hey, why I said it, <laughs> hey, bro. But hey, you want to know what, dude? That's you. No, I know. Like, but, bro, I got zero judgment uh, on people. No, but I, neither do I. I just, it's, uh, it's a standard for me. For you to be when I I don't sit throw best friend around very lightly, right? right? And so for you to be my best friend, I got I got to see you in your worst and your best. I yeah, got to see I got to see if you fucking you know you freaking bang Asians on the weekends, and I <laughs> got to you know what I'm saying I, I got to see that on you. I got to yeah, see bro. I got to see that I got to see that your highs and lows. I got to see your dirt, and when I know your dirt and you know my dirt, then we're best friends. Yeah, truly. And, I mean, when you're completely honest and open, and they know everything about you. And they love you anyways, and vice versa. That's true, best friends. Yep. And so that's why I don't throw it around very often, you know. And just, Dude. and that's and that's true, and that's what. And just the t- the guys I have in the teams, I was able to see their dirt quicker. Yeah. <laughs> you know? it's, and that's, you know, I got, I got to see a homie that used to 
Love to fuck one of those, like, uh, you know when you get those, uh, those Sex porn, dolls? porn bottoms, though? Porn bottoms? Where it's like, you know, it's like a, the ass and the pussy of, like, a, a playmate. I mean, right? I haven't had one, but I know what you're talking but about. I know that he liked to take to the shower and bang the shit out of every morning. Like, I know I know that guy that used to like to fuck the, the bottom torso of a porn Good for star. him. Dude, good for him. Yeah, I know, Seriously, but I, like. Yeah, but I, I know that about him. I know what he does. I know that he's... He's not faithful or he's faithful to his wife. I know the deep, darkest secrets. And when I know those and he knows mine, then I, and he loves me anyways and vice versa. That's when I know we're home. See, bro, like, thank you. Thank you. Because, like, I feel that I know those secrets about my best friend. You know what I mean? Hopefully and he doesn't it's like, like to fuck goats, man. Uh, he does not like to fuck goats. <laughs> At least not that I know of. If, if he does, that's, that's a secret that I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but, dude, it's like, it's just one of those things, bro, like, you know, we do everything together. Like yeah. we're the same fucking person, bro. We drive the same truck. We had the same car. Like we're we're just we're into the same shit. And it's like people talk shit on it too all the fucking time. Yeah. They're like, oh, you got a CTSV because John got a CTSV. It's like, bitch, I got one first. Fuck you. You know. <laughs> yeah. uh, but anyways, it's like it's like, dude, I I, I just I know the th- shit that that dude's been through. Yeah. I know the shit that uh you know, I I know the secrets that he has. I know all that shit. Yeah. And it's like nobody, he was my best man at my wedding. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like nobody can replace that almost. Sounds awesome. Dude. Well, you, they can. They, you just got to see their dirt too. But I have. That's the you thing. I'm saying a new guy can. You just got to see his high and lows. And it takes time. Yeah, dude. It's a, it's a, it's a lengthy process. It's a good but, process. But so that's, that's, my, that's, that's, that's my follow-up question to you is like, do you think you have a barrier up no. to seeing these people's highs and lows? No, I just think uh, you have to show me. It takes time. I don't have a barrier. I just got to got to see it in time. So you're accepting to new people. Yeah, I you're just, just it, it takes time. Yeah, that's yeah. why, and that's why. I, Are you uh, willing to put that time in though? Well, it's different with families now, right? It was easier with, um, I guess. Yeah, of course, it just takes longer. So, like, when do you create those opportunities? Yeah, I mean, well, in in as long as it doesn't take away from my family. I do, you know, I, I do it with my biggest focus in life. Now that I have family is my family. That's it. Not even more of a focus than uh, my team guys, friends and that kind of stuff. Like my focus is my family and that's how it should be. She, they're, they're my fucking flock. They're my kin, you know, they're, that's it. So everything is easier when you're, you don't have kids, you don't have family. I can bro out with you. We can go through tough times now my main focus is that so it's it's in it's in respect to my family yeah. and a lot of people don't do that again remember i choose my wife over anything yep. so, so that's know. <laughs> that's i know that might have been an earlier quite my, that, dude, been that a, was that, you know i think <laughs> what, people people get fucked up with that thing dude, but I, one of the shows that we've been to or maybe it was maybe it was a show that i was on i was on somebody else's podcast and i told him that was the hardest question i've ever been asked that was pretty that was the hardest question I have ever been fucking asked. <laughs> it's a gnarly one. It's truth though. But dude, that like, and to be honest, that's the difference between me and you. I haven't had to think about situations like that. Why haven't you? Because I haven't been put in those situations. Well, you got to prepare yourself. Right, but I mean, who's preparing me? Me. Well, thank you. <laughs> but it's like I live I live my life day by day, bro. Like, I mean, I don't know if you've grasped on yet, but I'm an extremely spontaneous person. Me too. I could get a text message right now. It's like, yo, come to Hawaii, and I would go fucking book a flight for my entire family to go to Hawaii. That's just how I live. With like, your, yeah, I would do the same thing as long as with my family. Yeah, well, I, I, that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I'm if, if and if I see an opportunity arise in the split of a second, I'm taking that opportunity. Because I know that my life can be gone tomorrow. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I, I do not miss opportunities. But if you had to choose I'm between, an opportunist. If you have to choose between an opportunity that is you or your family, what would you pick? What do you mean? <clears throat> Say if uh, your daughter had, like, a, a play date or, like, a, I don't know, like, a, a choir event at the thing, right? Yep. She's excited about it. And she's like, fuck, this is my best thing in the world, and now I want to go to it. I want you to be there, Daddy. And you're like, hey, I have an opportunity where you can make almost $5 million or possibly make $5 bucks if you come to Hawaii for a thing. Would you, what would you pick? 
I, w- I would try to figure out some fucking way to do both. I'm saying, pick the family. with you. I know, but just pick. I'm, I'm going to, because he, he, here's what I'm going to think about throughout that situation, okay? Okay. Hey, I need you to come here and come to this choir event. Yeah. Because I really want you to be there. That's very important to me, especially me. Yeah. Okay, because my parents never wanted to be involved in anything that I was about ever. So it's a pretty loaded question. So okay, like, yeah. but, but but listen, but listen <laughs> to me. Let me let me break this down for you though, right? I, I know the answer that you were trying to get. You yeah, it's, it's let, pretty, let's let's it's, be it's open pretty right extreme now. question. Let, no, 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 it's not. Look at me. You want me to say, I'm going to go pick choir with, my, with Heverly. That's or, what you want. Or, yes or no? Or uh, what I'm I guess what I'm getting. Yes at. or no? Yes, but like what I'm getting at is. Don't get too focused on opportunities of. But here's the thing. I'm looking at that opportunity as how is this going to benefit my family? Yeah. Right? I, I, it's, it's a hard one because that was too extreme. No, no it's <sighs> not though. Okay. So for instance, that lion's den thing that I flew into, yeah. right? That was extremely spontaneous. Last minute. I was literally hitchhiking to get to this event. Yeah. Like it was fucking wild, bro. Yeah. And. The only thing that I could think of while I was doing booking these flights in this hotel and figuring out how to get to this event was like, okay, I need to get my mind in a right space so I can better our lives for my family. I need to be the person to lead. I need to be that fucking lion, right? I need to be that person that leads my family in this direction that is 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 you know prosperous and just just so much blessing so many blessings coming into our lives and i need to create those opportunities right so it's like i i take on these opportunities that come in no matter what they are i try to look at the positive positive sides of things and if there's other obstacles in the way that's just god's way of testing me of okay how do you come over the overcome this shit to be able to make it worth it i guess what i'm saying is there's a balance there is a balance there's a balance of too much and too little yep and if Burning can you, burning a candle at both ends. If you uh, if you let one go awry, <clears throat> you don't want to be poor either. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> you want you don't want to be poor, but at the same time, you don't want your kids to be unguided. If that makes sense. Yeah, dude. And it's like I came home and I did nothing but spend time with my family. And then do that. I'm not saying I'm not saying I'm just saying like no, but it's it, that was an extreme thing. I, I probably would have picked the five million dollar thing too. But. <laughs> just, no, it's, but but it's not it's not it's not the monetary value. <laughs> I didn't get any money from doing that. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I got a thought in my head that changed the way I think about certain things. The, and to be honest with you, the one thing that I took away from the 24 hours I was there was being more communicative with my wife, being more open than I already am, which I'm already really fucking open with my wife, dude. Yeah. But being more open with her about the weird shit that sometimes we're afraid to talk about or, you know, like finances, right? Like sometimes as men, we're really like, okay, you know, sometimes we'll have financial struggles and we want to carry that weight. We don't want to have our wives have that weight on our shoulders. Fuck that shit. I I want you to know exactly what I'm going through because if I'm going through a financial burden at this time and I'm stressed out and pissed off about something, I'm going to be pissed off about some 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 other little thing is going to piss me off. Okay? And you are going to try and help me or fix me on what you see, not what you know. Yeah, but I, me I give all the finances to D. But I, I'm just using the financials as an example. example of right? Budget. So like if if you only you only you know what you know and you you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. Okay. So like if I'm giving you and that's what that has to fall in that falls into the same conversation of like what truth do you actually deserve? You know what that's I mean? Saying, you yeah. deserve the entire truth, right? So it's like if I'm dealing with this financial struggle, but I'm taking the anger out on the fucking dishes not being done. Yeah, she won't know the exact You're trying to help me because the fucking dishes aren't done. Yeah. Not because I'm actually pissed off and stressed out about the uh, you know, financial struggle that I'm going with. Yeah, yeah. And and like that one trip, dude. That's the only thing I took away from that was yeah. I need to be communicative. What's overly, going on. overly communicative with my wife on every single thing that I'm going through and dealing with. No, if, even if it's fucking stupid. It's pillow talk. You know what pillow talk is, right? 
Well, I mean, my pillow talk definition might be a little bit different than yours. <laughs> Pillow I'm talk, man. That's when you let it all, when the kids are asleep and you fucking talk, it's like your hour to let it all loose. Tell them about your day. Fucking get everything uh, all focused up or she knows where you're at, vice versa. She talks about her day. Pillow talk's huge, man. Yeah, dude. That's a big thing, too. I always, like, they asked us today on that thing, like, hey, what keeps you guys loyal and that kind of stuff. Dude, our pillow talk is gets intense, dude. That's yeah? good, man. Yeah. Just talk about it. Talk about everything. Your day fuck, I made a bad investment here. I did this. She's like, well, what did you do? And this kind of stuff. And she tells you about your day. Dude, fucking that's key, dude. But 100%, man. I agree. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I've <laughs> I've had a little bit of a struggle doing that because we work together. So she was she was a number one sales rep for a company called <coughs> uh, Super ATV. Okay. And she was selling for this other company. And I was like, hey, if you're selling for this company, why don't you, why wouldn't you sell for us? Oh, why I don't why don't you quit your job, ah. come work with me, and feed into your own family's pot? You know, you'll have the freedom to do whatever you want, whenever you want. You know, <coughs> and the struggle that we have dealt with throughout that time is we don't get to go home and talk about our day because we're experiencing the day together. Yeah, but you still talk about it. We do the we, same thing. We talk about it, but but it's also like 90% of it's fucking work, bro. Like It's like, oh, I did this. You know, it's like, I know you did that. Like, it, it, it it's just a never-ending vicious cycle, I should say. And ne- But now it's to the point, it's like, you know, we're talking about the thoughts that we're actually having in our head. Like, hey, yeah. you know, this little thing bothered me. And before, we would hold that stuff in. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. You know, like, we would... And and we try to really think about the things that are actually bothering us and like, hey, why, like, at least me, well, no, and her too, we'll we'll be like, okay, you know, it it bothered me that you didn't help me with the fucking laundry today. Okay, why? Why why didn't it help me? Or why, why did it bother you? Well, because I feel like I've been doing this. Okay, well, you have been doing that, but... You know, let me let me try and hear your your perspective on the situation, right? And uh, the whole perspective thing is 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 absolutely crazy, right? Like yeah. even sitting in this room right now, our perspective of sitting in this room is completely different. I'm very comfortable in this room, and I'm not saying that you're not now. But when you first walked in here, it was a little intimidating, right? Because you've never been in this room before. I'm in this room every single day, okay? And you know the 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 practicing thing that I do with this for different people. Is watch pull out your phone. Go to uh go to your notepad and start a new note. You got it. Yes. All right. Hey, Keen, say a word. Okay, hold on. Before you say a word, he's gonna say a word. Should I do it in the uh, the title or should I just skip it? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You're just you're gonna write down three things. Okay. Okay. Look, there's no look at me. There's no right or wrong answer. He is going to say one single word. Okay. The very what you're going to do is you're going to write the very first three things that come to your mind. Okay. There's no right or wrong answer. Just write down the very first three words that come to your mind. Okay. Okay. Keen, say any word. Uh, effort. Effort. I'm not ready. Things auto correct me a second. <laughs> Goddamn fucking Steve Jobs. <laughs> uh, fucking effort. I don't know. It dude doesn't matter. The first thing, the three, the first three things that come to your mind. I feel like you're practicing on this, dude. You're putting me in a stump. Just anything. It does not matter. Write down a word. You could write down the literally the letter, the word word. <laughs> okay. I got like sentences. I don't want sentences. I want three words. Fuck. I, uh... Three words of effort. Okay. Okay. You got three words? Yes. Okay, what are they? Us. I said pee break and fear. Okay, that's fine. There's, dude, like I said, there's no right or wrong answer. I had work, labor, and hardships. Oh. Okay? Well, so wait, now, wait, 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 listen I to me. I say what I say. Like us, it was it was hard to like, you know... Like talk all together and get to know you guys. I had to wait a couple times without pee breaks, which sucks. 
<laughs> okay, but listen to me. There's no right or wrong answers. Okay, so here's here's the thing. <laughs> here's here's the thing about perspectives. Okay, so we both had the exact same situation. Yeah. Right. We both had the exact same word. Yeah. Effort. Right. But we had completely different perspectives on think, what that meant to us. I think your effort was not talking without pee breaks too, because you had to pee. A second I now. had to pee. I, I got to pee right now. Well, that took a lot of effort. <laughs> okay, so what, what was your words again? Us, like, you know, mingling with us. Okay. Talking without a pee break or pee. Okay, break. yep. And then uh, and then talking without fear, so fear. Okay, fear. I had work, labor, and hardships, okay? So I'm going to need another shot if we keep talking. Are you ready? <sighs> Fuck, really? Well, All I right. mean, we're, we're into it again. You take a shot. I'm good. So so listen. Oh, oh okay, god damn it. Right. <laughs> today I was taking a shot, you know. All right, I'll go I'll go fuck myself, I guess. Hey. Oh, okay, I thought you said no. I was saying no. That's good. God damn it. Did you already take yours? Uh, yeah. So, perspectives are completely different, right? Uh, you know, we we both had the same word, but we had different answers, okay? Okay. The big thing I've learned... I do think you needed a pee break, too, so... I, I need another one. The big thing I've learned throughout realizing different perspectives is... I think the biggest takeaway I've gotten through that is relationships, okay? Yeah. So, in my relationship, when I am expecting my wife to do something... Yeah. Like, hey, I need you to do this, okay? The reason I am asking her that is because I've had all these little micro thoughts throughout my day. Yeah, you guys aren't thinking the same. We're not thinking the same. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Right? And this is th th that little practice, that little, uh, you know, test or whatever was a. Like the way I'm thinking. The, the way, way you're thinking. The is way different. you're thinking is not the way I'm thinking. Right? And when you can start to understand that, you can really start to learn how to communicate with other people. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Okay? yeah. Because you want to communicate with other people on how they perceive the information. Yeah. Not how you're thinking the information. So, and, okay, so for instance, my father-in-law, he always told me when we go out to like the sand dunes, we're big sand dunes people, right? Yeah. It's like when you take somebody out on a ride, you're on their ride. You're not on yours. Yeah, yeah. You need to ride to their comfort, not yours. Yes, 100%. Okay? So when I try to communicate to people, I try to communicate to them how they will understand the information that I'm trying to express to them, right? Yeah. How they're going to perceive that information. Yes. So I... I try to express things in, in many different manners of, okay, um, like, for example, you know, we just did the effort thing, right? Yes. You had three different answers than I did. But you should have had my answers. Why? I'm just fucking with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. No, you? <laughs> Whatever. No, no. I, I like, do. Dude, like, you, you yeah, lived through war. I didn't. Well, no, but that's, it's, that's what empathy comes in. I, right? I lived through yeah. loss. You didn't. Well, yep. and I'm not saying that you didn't. I don't know. But I, I, I know that I didn't live through war. Yeah. No, but I know I, that you didn't live through my life. No, but you can empathize. Empathize is key. So, like, <clears throat> my wife, so say she had different answers, right? And I'm like, fuck, you should have had my answers, right? But that's where empathy comes in. And you, you empathize and you listen to theirs and then you put yourself in their situation. And be like, oh, I understand that. Empathy is huge. And a lot of people don't learn that till later in life. Empathy is like a, the biggest thing ever, you know? But do you understand, you, you understand it how you understand it. Do you understand it how they are understanding it? You have to put yourself in their shoes. Right, but how do you do that? You think, you, you fucking, you know, that's what comes with wisdom. You know, you, you think of a time that you would have been in their shoes in that situation. You can think back and that comes with wisdom. Wisdom gives you empathy. Empathy doesn't happen overnight. It's hard right. to have empathy at a young age. You get empathy when you get older, right? So you think, she's like, fuck, you know, I just, I did the laundry for two days and I'm fucking, I hate my life and I had to make fucking, are you making another shot? Is that a second shot? And like I had to do, I had to do dinner for two days. Why this kind of stuff? So you're like, you think back and you're like, oh shit, I remember when, I was a fucking new guy and they made me do all their laundry and I had to cook for somebody, you know, and like, I, I remember that's where empathy comes in. And so as soon as they tell you, tell your stuff, even though your answers aren't the same as theirs, but they tell your answers, you empathize with them and you're like, you put yourself in their shoes and hopefully she you puts yourself in your shoes and then you come to a common ground and you're like, okay, and you calm down. Empathy is huge. And that's what I'm, I'm assuming that's what you're coming with, with those answers, right? Yeah. So you're saying whatever you said, you didn't say pee break. So I'm a little pissed off at that. <laughs> 
But no, you, you said certain answers, so then you just talk communicating, dude. You know yeah, I mean? and keep, with communication though, you still have to have empathy. So yeah. if you communicate that, like, so say like you know she's pissed off that you freaking, I don't know, talk to a girl too long, right, or something like that, right? And then you you put yourself in a situation ten years ago where one time fucking your girlfriend was talking to a guy too long and it pissed you off, and you come back and you come to a common ground. You can't, you can't. Uh, I guess you can't. <sighs> calm down and see and have common ground without empathy. And that's what that I'm sure I'm assuming that's what that drill does. Right. Yeah. Empathy is key. Are we done? With, are we done now? I, I feel like we <laughs> covered all the, yeah, man. No, no, no. We're good. We've, uh, <laughs> we've gone through a lot of stuff, man. Hey, Ryan, thank you so much, brother. I really appreciate you coming. Are we going to go through round two? Or are we going to go, we're going to start this up tomorrow and make this a marathon. You want to? <laughs> yeah, might as well. Let's see how this one does. <laughs> Dude, I think this is this is good, man. I I, uh, I I really appreciate you coming on, dude. Um, you know, and uh, if if you guys are looking for any kind of ammunition, uh, make sure you guys hit up canoeclubusa.com, right? Yeah, if you guys want ammunition, I've got it. Yeah, buy from Millions a true of rounds. Buy from a true American hero. This dude's a badass. He's a good friend of mine. Arm America. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Canoe Club USA, badass brand, badass dude. Badass father. Uh, I respect you an immense amount. Uh, I appreciate you coming on. If you guys aren't already, make sure you like and subscribe to the channel, and uh, we will see you next time.